Good evening. Welcome. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, December 4th. I am Select Board Chair Eric Helmuth. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format, consistent with provisions by the Massachusetts Legislature for remote participation in public meetings. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted in the Select Board Chambers and over Zoom. It is being, reading, being recorded and simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. People participating either in person or by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment. Those persons are not asked to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and people watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the town's website, specifically the Select Board Agendas and Minutes page. Tonight at the meeting, there will be several opportunities for public comment. If you are participating by Zoom and you want to participate in that public comment period, at the time that I announce it, please raise your hand in Zoom when I announce the public comment is open. If you're in the room, obviously raise your hand in the room. It's even easier. If you do not know how to raise your hand in Zoom, now would be an excellent time to Google for how to do so. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Our first item on the agenda. Uh, is to review and approve bond issue and related matters, specifically award the sale of the $18,090,000 in general obligation municipal purpose loan and all related documents required to execute the sale. And we have with us um, Ms. Julie Wayman, our treasurer. Good evening. That's okay. Good evening. Um, so just last week, we sold uh, $18 million in uh, bonds for a number of capital projects. Um, I'm sure you all know that we work with Hilltop Securities, and um, they worked with us on this sale. They let us know that we had um, an excellent result. We had 11 bids. Um, and they were telling us that a number of municipalities have only had between three and five uh, bids, so they were really pleased with our 11. Um, and uh, the result was um, we ended up, Fidelity Capital Markets was the uh, winning bidder, and the um, interest rate is um, a 3.69% over the life of um, the, the bonds. So they were really pleased, very happy for us. Um, this borrowing includes uh, 10 million in exempt debt, so that's for the high school project. Um, and then about four, a little over four and a half million for uh, the DPW, uh, along with a number of smaller capital projects, a couple of trucks. Um, we've got the Bishop School roof replacement. You know, we've got a number of smaller uh, capital projects that are approved annually. Um, you know, as you all know, we've got that annual capital plan, and so we've got a number of smaller projects. So for a total of um, uh, a little over eight million in uh, non-exempt debt, and then about ten in exempt debt. So we're very, very pleased, happy with the result, and we hope that you all will vote favorably um, <laughs> for the sale. Thank you very much. We do have a proposed vote before us in our agenda materials, and I'll turn to the board for questions, comments, or motions. Mrs. Mahan, I will make a motion. <clears throat> just a tickle. Um, just a quick question. Please. Um, are we voting the bonds of um, 1890 or the 17290? Let's vote the 1890 and then there's the 900,000 in premium. So yes, the, the ultimate um, cost to us will be 17 million, but we're going to vote the full, I think the language does suggest that full 18 million in that vote. Oh, it does, motion. but I saw the 922,000, okay. yes. which brought it down to 17. It does, yes. Yep, but we'd like to vote the full 18 okay. million. Okay, no, yep. just wanted, Thank you. just wanted to check. Yes. You know. um, if I could, Mr. Chairman, of I'd course. like to move approval of the sum of $18,090,000 in general obligation municipal purpose loans for our 2023 bonds. Second. Yeah, uh, Mr. Herb may have second it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, thank you, Ms. Wayman, and congratulations on the AAA bond rating. And, and uh, it is nice to see 11 bids because I think last year at this time there was only four bids for the uh, issuance a year ago, and the interest rate effectively is a little bit less than it was a year ago, which is, which is nice too. So that probably comes out of the bidding process. So 
um, 3.7 versus 3.77, but we'll take it. We'll take it. We're very happy with it. And I think we, you know, heard really positive feedback from Hilltop. So, yeah, yeah. I think that was excellent. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Dickens. Yeah. Mr. Corsi actually asked my question because I was wondering about the comparison. I mean, mm -hmm. And I had heard that Muni's were um, uh, be becoming, you know, well, being viewed favorably again. So this is kind of evidence of that, you know, and so, so the overall market is good for them and, and I think we're benefiting, you know, from just our, our high bond rating. So, so thank you um, very much. I am not going to ask the curiosity question <laughs> that I have. You know, I'll, I'll, I, will, I will call you uh, about it uh, directly, but, and, and then, I mean, uh, my favorite part about this is seeing the S&P um, report, you know, so one of these days I'll throw it into a word cloud and see how they all compare, but great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Any further discussion? Okay, on a motion uh, to approve by Mrs. Mahana, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you for your good work. Thank, Thank you for you. coming tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you, Reese. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Reese. Next item is uh, for approval, special event request, menorah lighting at Whittemore Park on December the 12th of this year. And I believe we have a um, representative, we have a representative here or on Zoom to address? Let's see if we have Ms. Mark and check Zoom. Nobody in the room? I don't see the applicant's name, but if there's somebody there that would raise their hand on behalf. Yeah, if you're in Zoom and you are appearing on behalf of this, please raise your hand in Zoom at this time. Seeing no hands raised. Okay. Uh, well, I think we could either um, take this up later this evening or just uh, approve it subject um, to the conditions in the, in the permit. Mrs. Mahan? I'd like to move approval of the special event request for December 12, 2023, subject to all conditions contained therein. I'll second it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then if someone does come later. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, then they would welcome them to speak about and help promote their event. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm sorry. I yeah. see them that they just logged in. Okay, sure. Yeah, we'll give them a minute. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Promote them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Great. We moved with uncharacteristic speed in the first part of our meetings. <laughs> I held back. <laughs> Let's keep it going. That's keep right. Going. So um, our board administrator is, um, there we go. There we go. Good evening. You can um, unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you like. Ah, there we go. Good evening, Rabbi. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Am, am, I, on, am I the first on the docket? You are. Okay. Uh, or near, nearly. We, uh, after, after we uh, approved the sale of $18 million in bonds, a small matter. Uh, okay. So, yeah, no, you, you're up. Uh, of course, the community knows and um, appreciates you and your, and your um, center's work very much. But if you'd like to briefly describe the event, um, the board would be happy to, uh, to consider it. Sure. So um, I, I know this is something new that we haven't approached the town officially yet with. Um, but in light of, of current events, uh, what's going uh, on um, across the world and the impact that it's having on, on many people in the, in the Jewish community that have been impacted and, and affected uh, personally. Um, we were wondering, we had the, the, the holiday of Hanukkah is coming up. In a, in a few days on this upcoming Thursday. And it's an eight day holiday. And we were wondering if we could ask permission from, from you, from the town of Arlington, to have a menorah, which is a symbol of, of light, lightness in, in darkness. And it's, it's something that we believe is, is beyond just, a, you know, just Jewish tradition, but it's more of a, a Jewish cultural symbol that, um, that is that is beautiful and and warm uh that lights up the public on on these eight days uh, of hanukkah and we were hoping to see if that would be something that 
you may consider for us to set up a, a nine foot menorah. Um, it will automatically with bulbs um, and will automatically each, you know, be lit, each candle would each bulb would light up every 24 hours until the eighth day of Hanukkah. Um, and we were hoping that that would be something it could be on any public property. I don't have in front of me. I believe we asked um, we asked for it to be placed on the green that is in front of the uh, the museum there on uh, on on Mass Ave and Pleasant Street. Um, but it really it's just anywhere on Mass Ave in a, in a, in a convenient place. Um, we thought that might, that might be something a nice a symbol of hope and light. Um, and so I, that's that's what I'm asking permission for. And I would, uh, I would we would greatly appreciate if that's something that can that could happen this year. Thank you very much. And I neglected to ask you to introduce yourself, even though we're you're well known to us. If you would do that for the public, please, for the record. Sure, sure. My, my name is Avi Bukit. I am the uh, the executive director and rabbi at the Center for Jewish Life here in Arlington. Uh, we've been serving the Jewish community in Arlington for over ten years. Um, we have, as many of you know, we have experienced. Um, we've experienced uh, a hate crime multiple times uh, in, 20, in 2019 from a, from a white supremacist, white supremacist group. Um, and then, of course, what has, what has happened over the past couple of months, many of our Jewish community members um, have been impacted. Many of, our, many of our teenagers who are in the community have been at school and, and the remarks and the comments there's been a lot of a lot of sentiment, anti-Semitic sentiment, anti-Israel sentiment, and uh, I just I felt this was an appropriate time to come to the town and perhaps uh, you know bring up this idea, this proposal. Thank you very much. Um, so I just I want to just to get some clarity on on the application. So that the the uh, event permit application that we have on our agenda that was um, published and in, in before us now is uh, just for a one day or one time event of, a, of three, two or three hours on December the 12th. Um, so I think that the board will have to contemplate, you know, if we would want to make any change to that um, to, I think if I'm interpreting the request, it would be, you know, not an attended event, but would be an unattended display appearing, you know, over a period of time and that's, you know, probably that's a different kind of request, I think, than, than we have here. Oh, oh, okay. So I, I might be confused here. So my, the the executive, the the director of programming, um, filled out the application. That it could be that 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 request was for. Uh, we have we've been having an annual um, menorah lighting at the Arlington Fire Department. We have like a gelt drop, and it's attended by hundreds of people in the community. Uh, Jewish people and non-Jewish people alike, and it's been a, a very big hit. And the fire department has been amazing. And we typically just we light the menorah with the firemen, with the, the chief of uh, the fire, the, the fire chief, for for an hour or so. We take we we put the menorah together, take it apart, and we're done. Right. Um, so perhaps that was the original uh, uh, request. What I'm what I'm asking is obviously for for something for something longer that we could just leave there. Um, and 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 it could be shown. It could be on you know in public display Understood. for for eight days. But you would still you're still asking for the for the permit to do the the um, initial event that yes. uh, was has yes. been at the fire near the fire station is now um, asked for in, in Woodmore Park, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. For thank you for that clarity. Um, I think I'm going to turn to uh, Attorney Cunningham because we did um, this was. Um, something that we we discussed and I think we, we wanted to be sure to kind of be prepared to help the board think through uh, what the options were. So Attorney Cunningham, if you would like to offer some some context and some advice about these different requests, I think the board would appreciate that before we begin deliberating. Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Um, this request, the one we had before the board was part of the materials, was just for the one night for two hours. But to the extent there is a request before the board orally at this stage, for something beyond that, um, I could just go into briefly what that type of request involves. Uh, the First Amendment is, is plainly at issue here. This is an open forum, specifically the property in front of the Cutter House. Uh, so the public has some right to uh, meet there, 
express views, uh, various other activities. But the government can place reasonable time, time, place, and manner restrictions on those activities um, subject to significant government interest and if, if, as long as it's narrowly tailored. Uh, the, the concern that I think that this might raise uh, to the extent that it was an eight-day period with an un unattended uh, menorah is that that may give the impression to a reasonable person that that's some sort of government speech that the Establishment Clause would be implicated in that case. It's similar to a case that uh, the Town of Lexington Select Board considered in 2001 where they had an application from the Knights of Columbus who wanted to set up a crash for a three-week three period. The board, after approving that for many years on the Battle Green, decided that that was an appropriate amount of time and was going to allow them a one-day permit to, to construct the crash but not allow it to remain unattended. Um, the Knights of Columbus didn't like that result. They sued. It went to the First Circuit. The town of, town of Lexington's actions were uh, affirmed by the by the uh, district court in Massachusetts. That's still good law today. I think there are some legitimate concerns about any unattended structure for whatever, whether it's religious or secular, uh, because the reason for that is not only a viol potential violation by the town, the establishment clause, but also these types of regulations have to be content neutral. So to the extent that this board would consider allowing an eight-day permit for one group, that would, that would have to apply to other groups that would come before this board. You cannot discriminate based on content. Um, but so, so in that case, Lexington faced requests from various groups, um, you know, whether it was, I think there was a Jewish faith group, I think there was a Christian faith group, there was a, a group related to the sun god Ra. That, that, so there, there would have been a collection of items unattended on that particular area, which affected the aesthetic value of that public property. And the court considered that when determined whether that was a, a significant government interest. And that considered in conjunction with the concerns about the Establishment Clause, the court determined that the select board action in Lexington was appropriate in denying that application. So I think those, those are the issues that the, that the board should consider as it uh, looks at a prolonged period or an unattended item on this public ground. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, ask the town manager if you had any further thoughts or comments on this before the board um, begins this discussion. You know, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jim Feeney, town manager. <clears throat> you know, I, would, I think the board grappled with a related challenge pertaining to the flying uh, of banners on this very building in the, the near future. So I think that, you know, in thinking back, though, I, I didn't sit in this chair at that time. I understood that the board made a sort of hard decision to discontinue that practice at that time, given the concerns that uh, Attorney Cunningham laid out as to setting, you know, locking yourself into future precedent with decisions that may be uh, presented before the board. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to raise that as a yeah. Yeah. Uh, somewhat related matter. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, Ms. Mahan, yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just want to let um, Rabbi Bouquet know that uh, right before you zoomed in, I did make a motion to um, approve the December 12th uh, request, um, and I, that would remain my motion um, for the December 12th request. I, everyone knows I'm a process person. Um, I'm not going to repeat what town council or town manager has said, but I know approximately 15 or so years ago, the board, uh, and this is before the last year policy statement, um, <clears throat> made a policy that um, any unattended events, that, that we would only do events, one-day events. Um, and there was quite a bit of concern because for many, many years we had had a nativity scene at the exact same site. Um, and we directed uh, that group to um, go to an uh, appropriate church that had volunteered, several had, um, to host that. So. Um, it, so it's a process question. Um, I'd, I'd like to s stay with that. So I, I'd just stand by my motion to approve the December 12, 2023 event request. Mr. Hurd. I have a follow-up question for Attorney Cunningham. Is there any open meeting law <coughs> considerations for us even to consider something outside the four corners of the request that's in front of us? 
Potentially, Mr. Hurd, but I think most likely the board has the discretion to edit its, if they wanted to accept the edited request, it could do so at this time because the issue related to the placement of the menorah at this particular site, although not for this time period, was on the agenda appropriately within 48 hours of the meeting. However, I think it's probably best practice for the board to not engage in that type of process, as I think Mrs. Mahan is talking about. I think the best practice for the board, and it's up to, again, it's up to the board, not to me, um, is to consider the materials it has before it at the time of the meeting. Yeah. Well, I'll certainly second the motion. I'm happy to support the event. Um, you know, we've been through this with, I feel like, a myriad of issues with the limited pu public forum in the past couple of years. Um, we have a very proactive citizenship or residents that have a whole host of causes that are really important to people in this town. And I think, while I certainly support the putting up a menorah, I, I would love to see it. I think it would be a beautiful sight to see, particularly in these times. I think it's really an important practice for this board to stick to just allowing individual attended events and I would anticipate that if we approved leaving a menorah up for eight days, in our next meeting we'll have anywhere from 10 to 20 requests to put something else in Woodmore Plaza. And as Attorney Cunningham mentioned, we really have no, once we approve one, we really have no discretion to say no to anything else. So um, I think as a best practice, it just, it's in the interest of the town to stick to our current practice of just approving limited engagements that are attended by individuals as opposed to permanent structures. So, so I, 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 I will give Mr. Hurd the second. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, uh, and, second. <laughs> so, so, and, and I'll, and, and I'll, I'll add to me, you know, I see that no police detail um, is, that box isn't checked. You know, I would say, I'm sure that we, we are going to make sure it's a safe event. I mean, whether or not, you know, that box is checked, I me, mean, but to the extent, I mean, we need to consider that a little more, I mean, then let's do, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Feeney. Thank you, Jim Feeney, town manager. Uh, yes, Mr. Diggins, we would ensure that any and all necessary security was provided for the event. And I know that the Arlington Excuse Police me. Department uh, worked closely with the rabbi and his team. Great, thanks. Mr. Corson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I support Mrs. Mahan's motion, and um, th this was what was before us um, this evening, and, and for the pra best practices that Attorney Cunningham um, spoke about as well. So um, I support the, the vote in a second. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I'll do the same, and I, I want to be very clear that. Um, you know, th this really is the board's responsibility is to think about the big picture, to think about precedent, to think about what could happen next, um, and not to make these decisions because of any lack of, of support and empathy for what uh, the rabbi's community is going through right now. Um, that's the furthest thing from our minds. I think that we just, we have the responsibility to, uh, to really protect the entire community and think ahead um, about, about the big context of these decisions. So I am also comfortable with, um, with that. And also just, just out of an abundance of caution, given what we did notice on the agenda for this being a one-time event, I think that that's uh, the better practice this year. Um, so um, any further discussion from the board? Okay, so we have a motion uh, by Mrs. Mahan and an inherited second by Mr. Hurd. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Is unanimous. Um, I look forward to the event. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your consideration. Thank you very much, sir. Good evening. That brings us to the consent agenda. We have items four through seven, the minutes of the meetings of November 8th, the uh, Arlington Education Foundation 5K race on May 19, 2024. And I'll just note this is uh, on this consent agenda because it's uh, very similar, if not identical, to the conditions that we approved last year. Uh, approval for winter banners from the Chamber of Commerce, 
and a request for a contractor drain layer license, Genesis Utilities Corporation in Brockton, Massachusetts, specifically Declan Fitzpatrick. I'll turn to the board for any motions or comments. Move approval. Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda items? Seeing none, all in favor please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous, 5-0. That brings us to uh, our row of assessors. <laughs> we have a property tax classification. So we have to figure out what we're doing with who's speaking and who's standing and who's sitting. Uh, ACMI has asked that if um, they're standing, move the microphone up. If we're sitting, move it down. You all sort that out. I think we have the chair here and the director of assessments. So who's, uh, who's representing? <laughs> chair Jameson? Very well, sir. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Hemleth. Um, I'm Gordon James, and I'm the current chair of the Board of Assessors of Arlington, and we are here for the annual tax classification hearing, a meeting that I've attended many years before becoming uh, a member of the board, and it's, I think, one of the most important uh, sessions that the, that the, uh, the, board the boards together hold. Uh, joined with me, joining me tonight before the board are our our talented uh, director of assessments, Dana Mann, and the other two, and also equally talented, the members of the board, um, William Sagata, Bill Sagata, and Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor, who you've all seen before in previous sessions. This is my time, this is my year to have to do this song and dance. <laughs> so, so basically, um, the, the, the end result of tonight's meeting is you'll be voting for a tax rate and for voting for a factor. And, to and, and we provided a, um, the director has provided you with a, the, the annual uh, set of information. And I'll leave it with uh, Mr. Mann to take you through that. And after he's concluded, um, he and the board will be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Mr. Mann. And um, if you just bend the microphone down. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening, Dana Mann, Director of Assessments. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, does everyone have a copy of the uh, assessment booklet? Yes, thank you. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to start uh, by recognizing the other three members of the assessing uh, team. Um, our uh, manager, Mary McMakin, uh, Jennifer O'Rourke, and uh, Mitchell Suarez. Um, I couldn't do this without them. And hello to our town manager, town council, Ashley. <clears throat> um, we, we can, we're going to start by discussing what, uh, what makes up the tax rate. Um, we're going to go through some of the components. We're going to look at uh, what the single tax rate is. Um, we're going to discuss uh, the options behind classification. Uh, we, classification presents an opportunity to shift um, parts of the levy, uh, which would create uh, different tax rates for different classes of property. Uh, we'll then go to um, discussing the two other options related to classification. And then we'll look at the actual numbers for this year, um, the value of the, of the town. Um, and then we will conclude by looking at uh, what changed from, from last year to this year. And please, if there are any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt, and I'm happy to address any of your questions. Um, so starting on page one, and the pages are numbered this year. <laughs> <laughs> it just gets better and better, sir. <laughs> um, so to, to calculate the, the tax rate, uh, we look back to last year, and we take the fiscal year 23 levy limit. We add to that 2.5% for Proposition 2.5, that's the 3,383,913 number. We add to that uh, new growth. Um, this is uh, growth would be 
um, the value of new property to the town that we're taxing for the first time. Uh, we would then, this year, we, we don't have an override, uh, thanks to uh, some proper budgeting. We'll push that to next year. And that develops a, uh, the, the fiscal year 2024 levy limit, 140,020,933. We take that number and add the um, excluded debt, uh, in this case, it's um, school debt of $13,830,576. And that gives us what's called the maximum total to be raised. That's the 153,800, I'm sorry, 153,851,509 number. Um, and at the bottom, we give the actual calculation for the tax rate. We take the amount to be raised, um, or actually we take the total taxable assessed value, that's uh, 14,523,850,398. And we divide that by the amount to be raised, the 153,807,575, and divided by 1,000, and that gives us a tax rate a single tax rate of $10.59. Uh, the difference between the maximum total to be raised and the uh, amount to be raised is called the excess levy uh, of $43,934. So moving to page two, uh, we look at the current makeup of the town in terms of uh, class, class of property. And uh, once again, the, the town is um, significantly residential. The residential property comes in at 94.6555%. Uh, the total, what's called CPI, commercial, industrial, and personal property, uh, comes out to 5.3445%. And you can see the makeup of the individual classes there. Turning to the next page, we are provided with some numbers by the DOR, which uh, gives us the, the target numbers where we're allowed to shift some of the tax levy uh, e either direction, but generally it's <laughs> um, increasing the CIP levy and decreasing the residential levy. But it, it's, it's an option. Um, so the number, the number that we want to look at there is the minimum residential factor, 97.4767. Let's us calculate the minimum residential shear. That's the number below that, 91.98. And from those numbers, uh, we move to page four. And this is what gives us the range within which amounts can be shifted. The, what's called the um, CIP maximum shear is calculated at 8.0168%. The single rate shear is 5.3445. So that, those are the two numbers within which we can shift. And on the next page, at the bottom of the page, we see the totals. These uh, CIP shear of levy um, this is the amount of the tax levy that's borne by the CIP. And the maximum CIP is the 12,330,510. So within that levy amount is the, the shift opportunity. And on page five, we see what, what that shift would um, would do to 
uh, taxes and tax rates. So if we follow along at the top, the top line is what a single tax rate would do. And then if we were to move 5%, um, you can see the effect that that has on the tax rate. The tax rate moves on the residential side by uh, $10.56 down to $10.56. And on the CIP side, $11.12. And that would mean a difference, a reduction in the residential tax amount of $14.95 compared with a increase in the CIP tax. And this is per $500,000 of value. That increase would be $265 on the CIP side. So a, a significant disproportionality in that amount. And then you can follow down that chart the various other percentages. Any questions on that? Thank you. Okay. Um, also within the classification uh, options is what's called the residential exemption. This is an option that's used by cities and towns in the, in the Commonwealth that have a large percentage of no, non-owner occupied properties uh, where they would see an advantage um, compared to owner occupied properties with higher values. Um, I want to stress that the <coughs> levy does not change in, the, in these circumstances. The um, difference in the tax rate is to bear the, 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 the cost of providing the exemption to um, uh, owner-occupied properties. Uh, and it's generally done in communities um, where there's a large investment pool, where investors are buying property and renting property, um, or in properties or towns that um, have a large um, non-resident or second home uh, property ownership. Um, the DOR has allowed uh, the maximum um, exemption amount of 35 uh, percent. Very few communities uh, move up to that, that level. Um, I've provided some examples of what this exemption would look like um, at various uh, exemption amounts. And it's in a percentage form here. Um, you can see the 20 percent uh, amount would create a tax rate for the entire residential class of $12.70. Um, and that would be borne by a fairly small percentage of non-resident um, properties. Uh, we calculate that at about 17 percent. Um, we also calculated what's called the break-even point. Um, this is the home value where a qualified resident would see no impact on their tax bill. Uh, values above that amount, even though they're qualified, will, would see an increase in their taxes. And properties under that would realize some discount. Any questions on the residential exemption? The small business exemption, which is another option under classification, would be very similar. The tax rate would be $10.85. I'm sorry, that's not in your, in your booklet, but we, we did calculate that. Uh, moving on to page 7, we see a history of the single uh, tax rates. 
for the town. And on page eight, <clears throat> often referred to as the LA-4, uh, which has been submitted to the DOR and awaiting our uh, certification. We see all of the values related to all of the different classes or property types on the left-hand side, and their total values moving to the right of the form. And at the, at the very bottom, in the bottom right corner, we see the real and personal property total value. This is the total taxable value of the town. Uh, 14 billion five hundred and twenty three million eight hundred and fifty thousand three hundred and ninety eight on page nine we have what's referred to as the LA 13 this describes and uh, indicates the abatement amounts that were, that were uh, allowed by the board in the various uh, property classes. And that would be column B. In column C, what we have is the new growth that was generated in each of those classes. Um, and the totals are listed at the bottom of the page. Uh, column E is the uh, total growth amount for the town, that's that $1,280,500. We saw that on the first page. Okay, this is, this is a little more fun, at least for me. Uh, moving to page 10. We can see what we, what we did in producing values for this year and how it uh, is different from last year. Uh, so we start with the single family uh, class code 101. Values in that category uh, increased by 11.26%. And I, I think we've all seen that in the sales. Um, The assessing department looked at over 730 sales to develop these values within DOR standards. Um, I say that just to uh, indicate the amount of work that goes into producing uh, these value numbers. Uh, we, don't, we don't just look at uh, Caldwell Banker and uh, come up with a number. Um, so I, I won't go through all of these numbers, um, but you'll see um, in total the um, all classes are up 9.1 percent. Um, and you can see the residential is slightly higher at 9.29 percent. And then at the bottom of the, of the page, it gives the actual totals for each class. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. This is Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I know all the codes stand for various residential and, and commercial properties. And I wouldn't expect you to know this off the top of your head. But just um, all of them se seem increment incrementally um, similar. I'm just curious, um, and it's close to 12%, so that's near the 9%. What code 504, 550 to 550, 552 is? Sure. 504 is um, utilities that are actually valued by the state. Oh, okay. So that would be um, things like uh, NSTAR. Okay. Um, electrical utilities, gas utilities, okay. and uh, yeah, 504, 504 you said? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. No, only because the rest I can see what's commercial space, open space, <clears throat> residential, and that, that was the one 
um, percentage wise that had sort of the biggest jump and I was like well what the heck is that utilities that's a big jump thank you yeah. and it's uh, it's also it's it's we've always as assessed the utilities um, but recently the DOR has enacted um, uh, a different method for calculating value um, they're looking at it a little bit differently, and so far it has produced higher values. So we've seen for the last three, three years a significant growth in that area. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Huh? Sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh, Any other questions on that? Um, so this page is, is similar to the first page, but it gives us some good... Uh, percentages. Um, this is page 11. And we can see year over year going back to fiscal year 2020, the various components of the tax rate. Um, what I'd like to point out, you can see that the under proposition two and a half, the uh, amount of that value and its effect on the tax rate has decreased and that's due to the increase the overall increase in values so as values go up we're spreading that amount over a larger value um, the other thing I'd like to point out is the levy increase percentage that's about in the middle of the page there uh, 3.33%. That's before uh, taking into account the exempted school debt. This is not in your booklets, but uh, when, you, when you consider that increase after the debt exclusion, it's uh, approximately 5.1%. So that 3.33 that, uh, would be the 2.5% plus new growth? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And finally, I want to I want to point out the um, average assessed value of the single family homes in Arlington. We've broken the million dollar mark, and the average uh, single family home is now valued at one million fifteen thousand one hundred and sixty two dollars. And you can see how that's grown uh, from 2020 uh, when we were at 825,000. Um, significant growth in residential properties. Uh, now, how does that affect the average tax rate or tax bill? Um, the average tax bill this year at the single tax rate of $10.59 is $10,751. That's an increase of $523 over the previous year. And just a reminder that all of these numbers are subject to rounding and DOR certification. On the next page, we get to compare that tax bill uh, to what we call our peer communities. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to get the data for these communities as they, they only recently, Winchester did have their rate approved on Friday, uh, but I was unable to get that data into the report. Uh, but I will, as soon as uh, we get that information, we'll get it into this uh, form and it, it's located on the assessor's uh, website. Uh, so just pointing out quickly, the new average tax bill uh, for the town is the $10,751. Uh, and just a note, that does not include the CPA tax. Um, significantly lower than our three peer communities. Um, who last year were all over $16,000.
for the benefit of uh, people at home and in, in, in the room, um, this material, all these materials are available on the select board's agendas and minutes page, but I'll just name that the three comparable towns here are Belmont, Winchester, and Lexington, and they are all uh, over six to six or seven thousand dollars more than we were last year. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Dickens. Yeah, so, do you have a sense of how we compare in, um, for uh, CIP? In other words, the average tax bill for uh, commercial industrial so we can look at that. Yeah, for the other communities? Yeah. Uh, just oh, I'm sorry. I don't have oh, yeah, yeah. information. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what I was going to have for the other communities. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, 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 can, I can certainly uh, get that information on the, on the booklet and for future um, classification hearings. Okay. Great. Great. Because it would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. To, no, to have a sense of I mean, whether or not we're competitive and what potential effects that have because that could also I mean since the 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 balance can be tipped in either direction I mean, you could imagine that a short a very small increase I mean in you know the property for for non CIP could have a really big effect on them and if it was made us more competitive then that could be an argument that's why I asked all right thank you yeah. very good Mr. Hurd? <clears throat> thank you for the presentation it's always good to get these numbers once a year and get reminded why we don't have a residential exemption, why we don't have a two-tiered tax system. Um, one qu question that came up early in the presentation, in the, and after six presentations of this, I should, probably should have asked this five years ago, but what accounts for the excess levy in that I understand it's that we're asking for less than the maximum total that we can raise? Is that just a budgeting issue? or No. Where we always talk about the constraints of Proposition Two and a Half, you would think that you would ask for the dollar figure exactly of what you're, what you can ask for. Sure. Um, so if we look at page <clears throat> eleven, uh, we we produce a number um, called the penny on the tax rate, and you see that amount is one hundred and forty-five thousand two hundred and thirty-five dollars. If we were to uh, increase our levy, um, it would, we, we can't have a tax rate uh, right. with three decimal points. Right. So we're, 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 we're actually levying uh, as much as we can, and that excess means we can't add another penny to okay. the tax rate. That makes sense. Um, again, Thank you for the presentation. I think every year, not only does it remind us why our taxes are what they are, um, it shows us, you know, what we need to do. I know Mr. Diggins likes to talk about new growth, and you know, new growth is really the key to stopping overrides. And these are the figures that show this to us. Um, but it also does show, if you look to, at the comparable towns. It shows that we've always said we get a lot of bang for our buck, you know, there. And the, I think some of these towns have higher property values, but Arlington's certainly getting in the mix when it comes to property value. And they all have similar services. This is interestingly, this, the same four towns that were in the Arlington Winter Classic <laughs> the hockey tournament last year. <laughs> Winchester won. I was going to say, don't say who won. It but was an Arlington McCoy. It just <laughs> jumped off the page when I saw these four towns. But again, you know, we have significantly lower taxes for similar, if not better, services than the cities and towns around us. And that's something to be proud of, and that's good administration, good fiscal management from the top down, and, you know, it's always good to look at that and it makes you feel a little bit better when as taxes go up. Yeah. So thank you for all your work. Thank you to the board for all the work that goes in all year on, on these valuations and it's all it, you know we like to say we take a lot of heat but i know the board of assessors can take some heat from some residents as well i mean no one wants to go out and, and get ta taxed higher but um we do thank you for all the work that you do to put this together each year absolutely and i'll remind the board as we continue our discussion at some point we'll need a motion for setting the tax rate um, Mr. Gorsi, did you want to go? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mann, for the um, presentation and to the members of the Board of Assessors for being here this evening. And as Mr. Hurd said, it's always very informative. Um, and, and I'd really love to pour, 
pour through all of this. Just a question, um, and maybe for an observation, it, it, it's, I, I know your count on condominium units has gone up by about 82 units. The number of two family units has gone down by about 40. Is that what you're seeing for conversions? Uh, exactly, we, we had uh, just that amount of, of conversions. I think there was also one three family that converted to two condominiums. Um, but that's exactly what those numbers show. Okay, and and then on the the one twelve, well, the one eleven to one twenty five, but one twelves in particular, which is apartments eight units or or greater, I see that's up by one. Is that the Myrac? Is that the beginning of the Myrac development? And I don't know. It seems like we'll have some growth this year, but perhaps more in fiscal twenty five from that project as well. Yeah, exactly. So we're required by the DOR. Uh, to assess the percentage completion on projects like that as of um, July 1. I'm sorry, July 31st. Okay. Uh, we have to have that percentage of, of completion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we determine a, a, a full market value and we take that percentage of completion um, as the assessment amount and the, gro the growth amount from that. Okay, and, and again, you, we don't know what growth is gonna be like next year. It seems like you have a few things. I know Mr. Feeney had said building permits are, are down more recently and that usually gets reflected a year or two out, but you've, you've actually um, achieved more than a million dollars in growth the past two years and, and I know it's a, a lot of pressure. Hopefully you uh, can find another uh, similar amount or a little bit growth there, but that's, uh, that's just encouragement and hopefully there's a, enough activity. Just two more comments if I could, Mr. Sure. Chairman. Um, on the tax rate, and I, again, this is reflective of values going up in Arlington, by the table you put in here, the 1059 is the lowest tax rate I think we've ever had since it's been reported 1061 back in 2004. So again, that just shows that relationship between value in, in tax rates because we're gonna grow two and a half percent, but but values are, are continuing, continuing to rise here. And um, the last thing I would say is on the exempt count, and thank you, it looks like there's been a real large increase in the value of exempt property, which we don't receive any revenue on, but it looks like it's about 7% of, of the overall, which I think compared to some other communities is probably on the low side, but it's, it's always helpful just to see that relationship. So thank you for the um, comprehensive presentation and, and for all the data. You wanna make a motion about uh, Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a motion, um, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mann, but by adopting a single rate, we will, what the motion would be is to adopt a residential factor of one. Um, right. And we're not going to do anything on the resident. I'm not moving anything on the residential exemption. We don't have small business exemption. So uh, just that single vote, Mr. Chairman. Second. Uh, Mr. Dickens, yeah, I had a, a couple questions. I mean, I had my fingers up because I saw Mr. Mann leaving, and I was like, "Oh yeah, there for him." <laughs> yeah. You know, so 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 quickly. I mean, uh, is is there a pattern to the new growth? That's a difficult question. <clears throat> there, there's several factors. There's um, the, the general economy um, that you would consider. There's um, uh, zoning issues can have uh, an impact on growth. Um, but yeah, we, we, we tend to follow um, a general pattern of the economy. Um, people are investing in Arlington. They're, they're um, adding to their homes, they're, they're building new homes, um, and all of that uh, generates growth. Okay. And, um, so, so, and, but it's, it's, it's individuals investing, not the corporations or anything like that. Well, we, we do have growth. Um, in, in all of our class, well, not, not all, but in, in the commercial end as well as the residential side. Okay, and, and actually what I was getting at is in terms of the residential investment, that's from individuals as opposed to companies need. need. Yeah, what I mean by investment in Arlington is um, the interest in, in buying houses in Arlington is generating competition, which raises the value 
of the homes and, uh, and interest in the new homes that are being built and in increasing those values, which in turn increases growth. Gotcha. And the reason I was asking about that is, is that I think MAPC just recently released a study being on speculation. I mean, and, and for them, I mean, the speculation I mean, is, is they define that as investing or investors. And so I was just trying to understand I mean, I mean, if we're talking about the same type of, of thing. So I'm just trying to get what I'm getting. I mean, yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't classify it as, I, I think we're using the same term a little bit differently. I know, that was confusing <laughs> when they did that. It's like, people are like, what do you mean? You know, I mean, so, so, who, okay, great. And, and I would be interested in the, the data on the small business exemptions. I mean, that's, is that on the website or is that something I have to ask you for? Um, no, I think uh, I can provide you with those figures. Okay, great. And, right. and then we'll, we'll look at incorporating it in the... Yeah in the booklet yeah. in the coming years. Not, not to even remotely affect me, my feelings about the motion, you know, so. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Any further discussion? Um, thank you very much. Thank you to the board for your service to the community. It is um, extremely important and um, Mr. Mann, your excellent work is known by reputation and demonstrated tonight. So thank you very much. So we have a motion um, to adopt, is it? Is this a public hearing? Yeah. Oh, it is a public hearing. Sorry. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mahan. This is a public hearing. So if anyone would like to, before we vote to set the tax rate, make a public comment. If you're on Zoom, raise your hand um, on this item, or if you're in the room, please your room, uh, raise your hand in the room. Okay, I think we're good. So on a uh, motion by Mr. DeCourcy to set uh, the tax rate with a residential factor of one. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's a five nothing unanimous vote. Thank you, Thank you, you. very much. Thanks for all. Thank all right. Uh, also, on a public hearing, we have uh, the Montague Street Betterment request to repair private ways, a betterment order. Um, and we have a representative here in the room or on Zoom uh, to briefly talk about that. Welcome. Come on up. Good afternoon. Good evening. Just introduce yourself, sir, and uh, give us a, a quick rundown. We have the documents in front of us. Sure. Uh, Rui Mascarenhas, resident in 99 Montague Street. Nice to meet you, everyone. Um, representing our neighbors, trying to fix our street as much as we can. Uh, we started the process. We followed all the procedures, and now I think we're kind of in the last stages of getting the town's approval to fix at least short term our potholes and then long term uh, the first part, the lower part of Montague. And then we're waiting for the technical, for the towns to give us the um, technical details for the upper part of Montague to see if we can fix it as well. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any questions, comments, motions from the board before we? Um Actually, let's do public comment. You want to do public comment first? Yeah. Um, we'll go ahead to public hearing. It uh, looks to me that we have, uh, there were no objections that I noted in this, um, but nevertheless, it is public hearing. So if you are here and wish in the room or on Zoom, wish to comment on this betterment before the board discusses, please raise your hand. Okay. Seeing none, Mr. Hurd. Um, I'm happy to move approval. I just have a question for the town manager. Similar to the betterment request that we had a couple months ago, do we have to make a motion subject to availability of funds? Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. That would be correct if the project were to proceed before July 1st. Okay. But we would expect, given town meeting's action, that as of July 1st, that that would not be an issue. Okay. So. I'll move approval subject to availability of funds if the project is to proceed prior to July 1st. Second. And oh, sorry. I, I don't know if for the applicant, if the town manager just wants to briefly explain what the issue is with that. Sure. Sure. And thank you for raising that point. I actually, you know, have been in touch with uh, some of the folks from Montague Street about exactly the same thing. but. Given the large number of betterments that have processed 
through the board, and as you know, you know many folks choose to pay up front for that, uh, but there's you know at least a handful every time around that do not, so we're not collecting those funds uh, until quarterly payments are received over the course of five years, so it takes, we can tend to deplete the account faster than it replenishes with uh, collections unless and until the town through town meeting takes an action to sort of seed that account with money and with the number of betterments that we processed and the size of some of those betterments this year, we've sort of uh, stretched beyond what we could afford. And this fiscal year, unless of course th the residents were able to provide additional funding beyond the one third required upfront and as was done with the last betterment that approved so that it could proceed uh, on a faster timeline. Thank you. So, can I, can I ask a question? A, oh, yes, sir. So what would be the, that minimum threshold to get be above the, say it's like two thirds, 50%? Uh, as of today, I calculated around 55 or 65%. But that changes uh, really almost on a daily basis as to when the uh, board's office would receive uh, payments via mail. Okay. And I'm assuming nothing can be done before April. Even if we... The, the, the moratorium would be in effect through middle of April anyways. Thank you. I think we had a second from Mrs. Mahan. Any, uh, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I, th I will say, and Mr. Hurd noted this, it's nice to have a private way betterment request that's unanimous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, 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 I know everybody who responded said yes, as one person didn't. But just for clarification, what, what portion of the, the street, you said it's not the entire street. I'm just curious what, what section will be done as a result of this. So it's, we're, we're trying to do everything. Mm -hmm. But it's taking me a while to get my neighbors from, let's call it, Upper Montague okay. to say yes or approve the, the process in, in mind. So it's from Madison, sorry, from Orient to Madison. Okay. We All do right. have the signatures to start the upper part of Montague, but we're waiting for the, from the engineering department to give us the technical details. Okay. So we can send it to the paving companies for them to give us a quote. Okay. If this only starts in April, maybe by then we can have a full Montague fix because as my neighbor Anton is there, you will attest there's a huge problem coming from Upper Montague, so to speak. There's a pothole that comes from underneath the water and creates like a, an ice rink in his house. So we would like to have that fixed as soon as possible. If we cannot, cannot have the full Montague, at least 50% of Montague fixed. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, if I could, based on that answer, uh, Mr. Chairman, the main question for Attorney Cunningham is, on the order, should we be putting the parameters of, of, of the work at, in terms of what, what portion of the street? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, and we've already had the motion, for maybe as a friendly amendment, to, to add Montague Street between, right, for right now, between Orient and, and Madison. So amended. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Dickens. So I'll notice that the, the one person that's missing lives at zero, Montague. So I think, I th I think it's the typo. So, so, uh, so I, was just, I was thinking yeah, I've never seen a zero be for an address, you know. You land. Huh? It's, a, it's an empty lot. It's a, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Owned by a trustee or a trust fund. I tried to reach them, but no reply, so. All right. Well, that explains that then. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. I was wondering that myself. All right. Yeah, I couldn't resist. I said, I said it wasn't, but I couldn't resist that one. So. Okay. Any further discussion? So we have a uh, motion by Mr. Hurd, uh, as amended by Mr. DeCourcy, and seconded by Mrs. Mahan to approve uh, between Orient and Madison. All in favor, please say yes. 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 And opposed? That is unanimous. Uh, perhaps we'll have the pleasure of seeing you again. Um, in the coming months. Thank you very much for your service to your neighbors and community. <laughs> I know you. how hard it is and I know that they appreciate mm. it. Yeah. I, I thank them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brings us to item 10, um, appointments. So we have, um, first up, we have three appointments this evening. Uh, we have the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture Grants Committee, formerly known as the Arlington Cultural Council. And uh, we have the uh, appointee is Shelly Shabra. 
we have Shelly coming in on Zoom. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, if you could just introduce yourself and just make a brief statement about your interest in service. My name is Shelly Chabra. I've been an Arlington resident since 2010. I have two children in the school system, and I have had experience as, um, I guess, on the other side where I was applying for grants as a cultural arts educator. Um, and that brings me to wanting to volunteer my time in this town to help promote public art and immersion in cultural arts education. Splendid, thank you very much for your willingness to serve. I will turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. I'll make a motion to approve. And thank you very much. I mean, uh, uh, so, and as you said, you've been on the other end. I mean, so, so of uh, the the grant process. I mean, so I am sure that you will understand I me mean, what goes into you know, I'm making a good grant and then um, and then approving that. So thank you very much. Do we have a second? Anyone? Second. Mr. Hurd. Always happy to welcome fellow jumbos to. The service of the town of Arlington. I think Thank we you. just missed each other. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I think we're good to go. Thank you again for your willingness. This is an important function, and, and I think Arlington is one of Arlington's great, one of Arlington's many strengths is our commitment to investing in arts and culture and, and cultivating that engagement with the whole community. And I look forward to the good work that you and your other commissioners will be doing on the committee. So on a motion to appoint by Mr. Diggins and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you again. Thank you. We have uh, item 11, appointments to the Elderly and Disabled Tax Relief Fund Committee. Um, applicant is Michael Quinn, um, who is also in Zoom. So let's bring Mr. Quinn in. Mr. Quinn, when you are, uh, here he comes. You can uh, unmute yourself and go on camera if you wish. I don't have a camera hooked up, but I do have a That's microphone. That's all right. Though. Good evening. Thank you very much for your willingness to serve. Just tell us, uh, introduce yourself and uh, express your interest in serving. Sure, my name is Michael Quinn. I live in Precinct 10. I've been a town meeting member since 2003. Two kids who went through the Arlington school system. I currently serve on the um, uh, Board of the Council on Aging. I'm in the board chair for the last few years. I've also previously worked on the tax aid program doing um, uh, taxes on a volunteer basis for low income elderly in Arlington. And um, I'm familiar with the work um, from a distance of the Elderly and Disabled Tax Aid Relief Fund Committee because it's something that uh, the Council on Aging and the Board are, are aware of from that. Um, previously, uh, Rick Fenton, who was on our committee um, on the board, served uh, on that committee. Uh, he passed away earlier this summer, um, and um, uh, I've been getting to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the, the processes and things from him for that. Um, but I'm looking to serve on that committee, and I'm hoping uh, to continue along in the work that, that's been done there. Thank you very much, sir. If you, uh, can, you, if you can do town meeting for 20 years, I bet you can manage this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'd, I'd like to move approval and uh, thank Mr. Quinn for his, his willingness to serve, but also thank him. As he mentioned, he's the, board ch the chair of the uh, Council on Aging, or the board of the Council on Aging. And his term is up actually this year till be stepping down from that. But uh, Michael, I want to thank you for the important work that you've done in, in leading the board and, and uh, attended a number of meetings and you, you do a wonderful job uh, in, in that position. I'm happy to support you for this role. You're here. Thank you. Uh, no, this is Mr. Hurd. Sure. <laughs> I just second that motion. Just continue down my Tufts <laughs> path here. I was actually an economics major at Tufts. Um, it looks, I don't think we were there at the same time, but I'm looking at a few of the, the uh, courses that you teach at Tufts, and it's bringing <laughs> me back. Whether they're good or bad memories, I won't say in a public forum, but um, again, thank you for your willingness to serve um, in any capacity in Arlington, and I uh, appreciate anybody that steps up, and especially, you know, everyone has a busy schedule, and fit in time into serve is not easy and we know from experience so thank you it's not just a select board meeting it's also a trip down memory lane right yep i was trying to get mr hurt to 
get the motion because I could tell that he wanted oh, it. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, so, sorry. <laughs> well, no, well, no, probably, probably, we, got you, we got you both in. So. Uh, but, uh, but yes, no, thank you, uh, Mr. Quinn. And, and, and I know the challenge is to get people to avail themselves I mean, of, um, of this relief. I, mean, I remember you, uh, I forget what forum it was, you, know, you said that I mean, I mean, a lot of people just don't I mean, um, utilize this resource, I mean, and, and it's important I mean, that they realize it's there and that, um, and that they use it. So hopefully you can help with that. So thank you. Great. Any further comments? Mr. Quinn, thank you for your exemplary service to the town, as Mr. DeCourcy said, and we do appreciate you stepping up to fill this role as well. So on a motion to appoint by Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous vote. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have a uh, uh, nominee for the uh, appointment to the LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Commission by Fiona Perry. Oh, welcome. Hello. So, good evening. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your interests. Um, hello, I'm Fiona Perry. Um, been in Arlington resident since 2019. Um, for the entire time I have been here, uh, I have benefited from the Rainbow Commission uh, through their various works, educating the community, uh, making sure that people like myself are welcome and feel as though we can present ourselves authentically. Um, and I want to continue that tradition and help make this community a more inclusive, better place for people like myself. Beautifully said. Thank you. I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> I'd like to move approval and say thank you to Ms. Perry. Um, I, we, we've said this many, many times. We probably couldn't afford you. <laughs> but thankfully, we're getting you as, as many other people. One of the core characters of the town of Arlington are the volunteers in the citizenry and um, willing to uh, take time, their personal time, family time, work time, in that order, um, to you know, work on making Arlington continue to be welcoming, but we can always do better. And um, sometimes the way we can do better is, is things that we just don't have a perspective on. So um, I, I do appreciate you stepping forward and doing this. And um, the Rainbow Coalition has, has many events to which we all come to, but we also always say if there's anything that the board, as a combined board or any one of us individually, um, we're here also as a resource, and we look forward to working with you in the, in the commission in the future. Mr. Hurd. Second, and thank you for your willingness to step up and serve. I don't see any tough connection, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, She's we'll signing up. No, no. no. <laughs> um, I mean, since its inception, the Rainbow Coalition has been one of the most active commissions that we have, and one of the most important. Um, I think it, it is time intensive, which I'm sure you, you're aware of, but um, it really is very important to, you know, f for the community that we create, for the kids that are in schools, and the partnerships that we have. It really is in a, uh, an important commission that we rely on a lot. So thank you for your willingness to serve. And not only more inclusive, but more fabulous, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, it goes without saying. I know, I know. And, and we've actually seen uh, 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 you in action in, in the, on the commission already. So, so uh, thank you, thank you immensely. Yeah. Well, I heartily endorse everything my colleagues have said, and I think we are ready for a vote. So on a motion to appoint by Mrs. Mahana, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed is unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming tonight. Of course. All right, this moves us to item 13, licenses and permits. We have four approval. Common Vigiler license, the Mill Cafe at 14 Mill Street. And good evening, Andrew good evening. Hunter. Yeah. Introduce yourself, and uh, thank you for your patience, sir. Oh, absolutely. You're, well, I'm Drew Hunter. I just serve as the executive director for High Rock Church and the Mill Cafe. Your question about what 504 was and his ability to answer just like without even looking down at his page was absolutely amazing. I wish he was here to like hear that, but yeah. that was incredible. Um, I'm meeting with him on reclassification. So okay, well, you let him know, right? That was a jaw dropping moment. Somebody has produced a lot of reports. 
yeah. and like tried to defend them in public. I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. Anyway, be sure to pass that on. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll send in the video clip. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Attempts to curry favor by flattering the director of assessments will be favorably looked upon. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, it was, it's a sincere moment. Uh, so let me talk about the Mill Cafe um, and just cast a little vision about it. So uh, High Rock redeveloped the property at 14 Mill Street from the garage and the sporting goods store and the auto body um, repair on the second floor and the auto parts on the first floor. We're talking about that space that was the auto parts on the first floor, which we've opened up all the windows as you've probably driven by or walked by and you can see into this space that is the lobby of the church on Sunday and what, we're, what we've been um, developing over the last few months since we opened on Mother's Day in that space for our first service is to have a, a cafe that's open to the public in that front space that um, looks out onto um, Mill Street. So the cafe is uh, going to be open. Ideally, we're going to open it for uh, five days a week, but we can't staff that yet. So we're opening initially in our soft launch for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, and we'll be open to public in normal business hours. Um, we're trying to make a space for the community. So we have a large space there that's kind of unique in Arlington. And we've bought um, a chessboard with two foot pieces and cool. you know, big uh, Connect Four. And we've made a corner that it has space for kids to play in. Um, but it's not really about that. It's about the fact that parents and caregivers need space to connect to one another. And the high school students seem to have a hard time having a space they can just be after school or um, do work or hang out with each other. And we have enough space for that to happen. Um, but, but we want to be hospitable in that, so we need to have great drinks. And so we have um, partnered with Counterculture Coffee, and we are offering espresso drinks and some basic baked goods and some pre-made sandwiches and a pretty much a grab-and-go menu um, for people to come in and to enjoy, to stay, or to go. Um, I think it's a really great space for that. I'm really excited about what that can do for the community. In addition to that, we've been partnering with the high school um, and talking to them about their disability program, uh, the way that they're serving the, disability, the students with disabilities. We have several in our community that are part of that program. We want to see what's the need there. And their need has been for job placement. And so we've got two students lined up that we would like to hire in January. And the cafe offers that space that they can get a job outside of the high school and get something on their resume so that they can then get the next job. I don't think they'll work for us forever. But that we could be that interim step. And as we've talked with them, now we've talked with other organizations in the kind of surrounding communities. And this need is huge. And so initially, we're staffing it with, with our team to learn, because we've never opened a cafe before. But come January, we're going to begin employing people with disabilities and making this a space that um, creates community for Arlington, but also is a community serving. Um, and we're excited about that. It's a nonprofit. We're not looking to make money. All the profits from the cafe will actually go to support other nonprofits, um, including uh, so, so the, the way we're doing that, to help people understand that, is that every time you buy something at the cafe, you get a vote. And we'll have three opportunities for you to vote where our profits go to, should we make profit. I know a lot of cafes don't. But if we do, <laughs> then what are we going to do with that? I think it's important because if you're going to come into a church like ours and you're going to go to a cafe, you might have reservation about whether, where, where, what am I supporting here? So let's be really transparent about it um, and let you have a choice in that. So um, we've had uh, Food Link in our basement for a long time. Um, we've helped support them and they've been a partner for us for years. So we're gonna have that be one of our options. And then we have an option that serves families on the border um, of Mexico and the United States and, and an option that's international. And you can choose. Um, where, do you, where would you like? And then we'll just divide our, any profits we get among them. Um, so I, I've not seen anything like this, which is just fun for me as a dreamer and an entrepreneur in this space. To, to bring this to you. And so I'm asking for approval. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Dickens. So yes, I mean, um, I, I'd like to motion approval and, and uh, be that creative idea about the participatory element of determining where the profits go, that, that's good. 
That's really good. I really, I really, really like that. So, I'll, and, I, and also, I like that you are be trying to help be those who are disabled uh, get employment. You know, and and so, um, and I don't know if that also includes you know um, people with Down syndrome. Being, but they tend to be very good good workers. You know, my one concern yeah. um, is on the uh, pest management. Yeah. You know, you indicate that you're using First Strike, which is a uh, it's a SGAR. You know, and so. So um, those are, are kind of bad for, for raptors, you know. And so oh. so we actually passed a, um, we, we had an article um, in our last um, warrant I mean, that really is trying to discourage the town from using them. Okay. You know? And so on the town side, you know, which we can control, you know, uh, we are no longer using them, or at least we're transitioning to, to not using them. We can't really affect me. Businesses, me, but we can sure. let you know, you know that, that it is a big concern, you know, yeah. in town. And so, so, um, but I mean, I really appreciate the transparency, I me, mean, well, not transparency, but that you're letting us know, me, that you, know, you do have pest management, you know, but we just wanted to um, flag that, all right? That's great. All right. We're just dependent on what they tell us we need. So, any, any direction like that is super helpful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. You're sure. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Hurd. Second the motion. This is exciting. I, I like to say, and I have to say this is probably the most enthusiastic common Vic presentation <laughs> that we've had in a long time. We have a lot of Good. you know Good. new businesses coming in that so it it clearly you uh, have put a lot of thought into this and I always like a homemade waffle, so <laughs> when I see that on the menu that's that, that's a keeper for me. So I look forward to it and good luck. Thank you. Ashley told me I could come and talk about whatever I wanted to, and I was like, well, then I'm, I'm bringing it. <laughs> she's been really helpful, by the way. I have no idea what to do, and she's been very good at guiding me. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wish I had a PREF code 504 question to ask you. But <laughs> everything's pretty explanatory here, and, and I do appreciate, as my colleague Mr. Diggins said, about um, having employees. Um, with disabilities, but it not only, as you know, uh, not only helps uh, the individual, um, it definitely helps the community yeah. um, to, you know, see, you know, everyone says, oh, diversity and transparency, and I'm not saying that in a sarcastic no. or negative way, right. but um, first and foremost are actions, and I, I think it's, um, I like it to be able to see it here in our Arlington community versus a, you know, a Facebook story out of Norwood or, Bend, Oregon. I'm going to get my town wrong or anything like that. But it really is is reciprocal. It's, it's someone who you know deals with that as, as we all do to varying degrees in, in um, my family life. So um, I, I thank you for the opportunity that you're giving to those two individuals in future. But even more so for um, the Arlington community, high school all the way up to if you can make it to 110, 120 years old. God bless you. Right. Um, you got a place to sit and hope your backpack's not that heavy. So thank you so much. Thanks. Mr. DeGorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank, thank you, Mr. Hunter, for the presentation and for elaborating uh, beyond the application in terms of the, uh, the plans for the, the, the proceeds and then and, and giving the consumer choice there. So I'm excited to support this as well. Great. And wish you the best of luck. Thank you. you know, likewise, I love the community vision for this. I think that Something that we hear often uh, in the town government is that the residents in general want more community gathering spaces and you know more cafes. And I think, I think we have not begun to saturate that that market. And I think this is a really unique vision um, with some really good ideas for staffing and for community space. So I wish you the best of luck. So on a, a motion to approve by Mr. Diggins and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank good you. luck. Good to see you. We look forward to the waffles. Me too. All kinds of interesting syrups, too. Oh, and all the syrups, yes. <laughs> all right, now we brings us to open forum. So, um, except, this is the part where I said get ready to raise your hands and zoom. Uh, except in unusual circumstances, any matter can presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted on nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. There is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Um, so um, if you are in Zoom and you want to participate in open forum, please raise your hand there if you're in the room. 
do the same thing only in real life. IRL, as the kids say. <laughs> Ms. Mar, do we have anybody raising their hand in Zoom? Seeing no hands raised. Seeing no hands. All right. Shortest open forum ever. All right. Let's Yay. move on to traffic orders, uh, rules and orders, and other business. And item 14. This will be a discussion and a potential vote uh, regarding House Bill 886, an act relative to combine. Sewer, sewer overflows, and I need, I'm going to step away for a moment before I do. If we have a couple, if we have two proponents, I just ask that you move the microphone uh, to the middle of the table. Um, I am, uh, I do need to recuse myself from this because of my employment by the Massachusetts Senate, um, and I cannot um, participate as a, an official of the town in, in a way that would uh, petition the legislature in any form on Arlington's behalf. So I will turn this portion of the meeting over to my trustee, Vice Chair, Mr. Hurd. All right. And thank you. So we will start with a presentation on this item. We have a few individuals here from Save the L Wife Brook. Um, if you can both just identify yourselves for the record, and then we can start your presentation. Uh, my name is Kristen Anderson, um, and I live at 12 Upland Road West. My name is David Stoff, and I live at 88 Fairmont Street. All right, and you can proceed with your presentation. Um, uh, tonight I'm presenting on behalf of Gene Benson um, and Save the Alive Brook. Gene is unable to be here, and he asked me to speak on his behalf. Um, Gene Benson and David Stoff drafted the language for House Bill 886. The bill was filed by Representative Dave Rogers and Representative Adrian Madaro and co-sponsored by Representative Sean Garbley and seven others. We are extremely appreciative that they filed this legislation. Um, as you know, Dave Rogers represents Arlington and Cambridge residents along Alewife Brook. Representative Madaro represents a neighborhood in East Boston and his family lives very close to a CSO. Um, this legislation addresses the CSO pollution problem head on. If passed, it would require CSO treatment or a higher level of CSO control, what the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority refers to as economically achievable virtual elimination. This would affect not just the Alewife CSOs, but all CSOs in the MWRA's system. Um, and to be clear, this under this legislation, CSOs would either receive disinfection and screening, or they would be engineered to discharge only in large 25-year storms. And 10 years is more than enough time to implement um, either or both of these changes. Um, next slide, please. Um, so why is this legislation necessary? Um, it is because 38 years after the legislature created the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority to end the dumping of sewage and sludge into Boston Harbor, and 25 years after the Deer Island treatment plant started treating the region's sewage to end Boston Harbor pollution, dumping of untreated sewage continues. 50 combined sewer overflows discharge many hundreds of millions of gallons of sewage, which is human and industrial waste, annually into Boston area rivers, streams, brooks, water channels, and the Boston Harbor. And 40 CSOs dump untreated human and industrial wastes into our waterways in larger and smaller storms without any treatment whatsoever. Six of them are in the small flood-prone Alewife Brook. This legislation would affect the 40 CSOs in the MWRA system, which have no treatment. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide shows CSOs in the MWRA system and highlights that in 2021, 1 billion gallons of CSO sewage was discharged. Elwife Brook is treated very unfairly, unfair but this is a regional problem and Boston must do better. Um, next slide, please. Um, so will federal law fix the CSO problem? The answer is no. Federal standards allow CSOs to continue to dump untreated sewage, and MWRA has made it very clear to us that it has no intention of doing anything 
beyond the bare minimum as required by law. This legislation is necessary and essential to ensure that the CSO entities do more than is minimally required by federal and state requirements for CSO control. Without it, very little is likely to improve with the alewife CSOs, and we will certainly not see a 25-year storm level of CSO control. Um, and last slide, please. Um, so now is the time for um, the legislature to act, and together we can address the unfinished business of the Boston Harbor cleanup. Uh, we ask for your support of um, H-886, an act relative to combined sewer overflows. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Turn to the board for any questions, comments, motions. Shocking. <laughs> Mrs. Mon. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair, Acting Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Stoff, who's been at this for decades. I want to thank the Save the Alwife Brook for this work and other work that you've been working in concert with the town. And um, whether it's NIPD's permit, MWRA, CSO, et cetera, um, we've gotten invaluable um, comments and expertise and insight from you individually, Kristen and David, as well as others, and I do appreciate that. Um, I would like to move approval of House 8886 in the 23-24 year uh, session. Um, and Kristen already outlined the reasons, you know, why this is important. But basically, um, as was stated, MWRA is going to do the minimum and, and, and nothing more. And um, yes, there are protections under the, the Clean Water Act, but, um, and town council can correct me if, if I'm incorrect on this, but there's nothing um, uh, forbidding us or preempting us from uh, requiring through the state that its entities, whether it's other cities, towns, or authorities, um, don't do just the bare minimum. Um, but do more, and especially when we're talking about con combined sewer overflows, um, this is something that um, I think will go a long way and where we do have momentum at various agencies and, and in the State House, um, I think this is worthwhile and it's not just a, a exercise, not that anybody has expressed this, of just spinning the wheels and doing something. Um, this is something that will, will definitely, I think, be looked at very seriously and has a really um, good chance of success. And I would ask that, uh, along with our support, if we vote that way uh, on, on the motion, that uh, a letter from this board addressed to the co-chairs of the Joint Committee on Environmental and Natural Resources, copy to the Senate President and House Speaker, our delegation um, at the State House, and as well as uh, uh, the gov Governor Healy, um, I think would be uh, a worthwhile endeavor because it would also give the people that are continuing to work on this, whether it's our legislative delegation, our citizen activists, our town manager, town council, um, something when they go seek an audience with those various individual individuals themselves or collectively that um, they'll, they'll already have sort of noticed that we're on our way in. So thank you. I apologize for being so wordy. <clears throat> Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. I'll second Mrs. Mahan's motion and thank you for all the work that you both have uh, been doing um, all along throughout these years. And, and uh, you certainly when you, the more we learn about this and the, the more we hear about it, and we spoke last meeting about just what happened on August 8th, 2023, and, and in a relatively short rainstorm, the amount of untreated sewage that, that uh, entered Alewife Brook and into the walkways, I mean, it's just something that's, that's, that's unacceptable in this day and age. And, and um, so we're happy to support it, and, and um, I would support as well a letter coming from the board, uh, as, as Mrs. Mahan outlined, and, and we'll keep talking about this and, 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 and try to get it done right. So thank you. So I am fine with supporting a letter from the board if it's signed the board. You know, 
a, a, I support the initiative. I mean, I do have a kind of philosophical position, I mean, about, you know, bringing these kinds of issues, not issues, um, uh, support of legislation, I mean, to the board. As you have heard me say several times, I mean, uh, I did this, I mean, I think in my second year, I mean, in supporting the real estate transfer fee, you know, bill. Uh, and, and as I said, uh, I regretted doing so. I, mean, I did so because the group that I was working with, the Real Estate Transfer Fee Coalition, uh, asked me to do so. I mean, and we had passed an article uh, in support of that. I mean, uh, but I mean, in retrospect, I felt that it wasn't the right thing to do uh, uh, because I didn't have a reason for I mean, doing it for the bill I supported versus I me. Mean, um, any other bill, I mean, like like this one, and, and also, I mean, um, I felt that there were more effective ways to go about getting that support. I mean, and I'll, I'll give you an example because it's interesting that uh, one of the sponsors or the the main proponents of the bill is uh, Senator Maduro, uh, 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 town meeting member. Um, Gamero, uh, I'm not pronouncing his name correctly, and, um, he had brought before us I mean, an article where he wanted support I mean, for um, high school, no, I think it was community college, um, the ability for any high school student, even if they're an, uh, a migrant, I mean, to be able to attend a community college. I mean, and, and the board I mean, decided to vote no action on that article because we felt it was kind of out of the scope I mean, for for Arlington's town meeting, you know, and I said that I would, I told him I really supported the idea and I would come back to him, I mean, and see what I could do to help um, with that. And I got back to him after the special town meeting and asked him how things were going, and he said it is part of, it was part of the governor's budget, you know, and so, so now they're getting that support. I was curious as to how how that happened, you know, and so I went to the legislation and I saw the exact language be, that was in Maduro's bill uh, in that budget. And so I, I try and back saying, so what was the mechanism by which that happened? He hasn't gotten back to me, but now Maduro, I, mean, I think, knows. My whole point is that I, mean, I think there are ways to really get I mean, um, what you want, I mean, um, and, and I'm willing to work to see how we can we can move this along, I mean, um, uh, and so I'm going to reach out to um, Representative um, Rogers and Garbley, and also Senator Friedman, because I uh, see what her take is on this. I mean, I didn't see her sign up um, for it, I mean, so I'm kind of curious. Yeah, uh, well, actually, it's not for me to direct it to you, but I, we can redirect me. You know, uh, but uh, um, so I, I really want to work this from some other angles, you know, and and see you know, what can be done to really help it get um, get passed, I mean, or at least probably become part of uh, another bill. I mean, uh, and I think there's going to need to be monies behind this. I mean, uh, so, so either whether that becomes part of another budget I mean, or maybe part of a bond bill, you know, I don't know, but I'm, I'm willing to, my, my abstaining on this doesn't mean that I'm not supporting it. I'm just explaining my kind of philosophical position. And also, I have to add one other element to this is that I know that the new coalition I mean, for a real estate transfer fee I mean, is wanting me to do the same thing again. And I've already told them I'm not going to do that. You know? And so I just need to be kind of consistent in across that. All right, that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm happy to support this. I, you know, I think a letter of support can be very persuasive. I think we've done it a number of times with the MBTA assessment and a whole other host of issues. And it certainly doesn't preclude all the other avenues that are available to get um, this legislation passed. So I think it is very worthwhile. I know we'll have some good language to work off of that we can crip from our own work of recently Le recent letters that we've drafted. Um, so just for clarity up from the board, do you, is the intention that I work with town council to just come up with a basic letter, send it, or do we want to come up with a draft, present it at a, a further meeting to the four members of the board voting in order to approve that letter? I'm, I'm comfortable with you just wor working with town council and, and the um, entities that 
I outlined, and I guess it will be the three members, I'm really saddened that Mr. Diggins is going to abstain on this because the CSO issue is really important. And when people ask, um, you know, what can we do and what are you doing, this isn't just a letter on a piece of paper, and I'm not going to comment on when you asked for it, we gave it to you on the, the real estate issue. Um, but this is one of the main issues in East Arlington, and um, your uh, – Abstention, meaning not supporting it, you know, will be noted. And um, but I know that others of us that are supporting it will make sure we contact not not only our legislative delegation but also the other reps, representatives and senators um, that uh, we have interactions with. And I'm I'm really uh, dismayed that. We can't speak with a common voice on this. I'm sure MWRA is kicking up their heels, and, and as well as, um, and I understand you're on different boards in, in the state with MAPC and MBTA and others, and um, it's probably good that for you that you abstain on this, but I'm really upset that you're doing that. And um, I would say this is something you should be doing as a member of the board, and to not do it is, is my personal experience. And we'll be friends when we walk out of here, but I think it's negligent of your duties to this very important issue. Thank you. Mr. Stiggins. So I, mean, I think I will be more effective I mean, this way because I will come back I mean, to, to probably everyone that you all, uh, well, you all, that the board will, will contact me and, and, and to the extent they, that they notice that I'm not there, I mean, when I come back and make communications with them, I think it will make an even greater impact I mean, so so I mean there are multiple ways to support things I mean and so I'm making it clear that I do support this effort I mean and and I intend to be visible on it but I do have I me mean, my philosophical position which I'm going to stick with for now you know I mean I, it could change but also I do want to make it clear that I me mean, even though you all did support that request on the real estate transfer fee I have said numerous times that I regret asking for it you know because I, mean, I felt it was the wrong thing to do you know, and, and so, and that was for me on this one, you know, but like I said, I have a position. And I appreciate you saying that we'll be friends after this. And I, I also appreciate your expression of your disappointment. I mean, that means a lot to me. And I will take it to, into account in future. No, oh, I understand situations. what you're saying. You asked for it, you got it, and you're not reciprocating. That's fine. Thank okay. you. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll work with town council and we'll Sorry, come up with, with the Sorry. appropriate letter and we'll get that si signed and sent. Um, so we have a motion to approve of the legislation and direct me as chair to work with town council to send a letter of the board support from Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. I don't have been writing them down like our normal chair. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Me, Glenn. Hi. That is a three zero vote with one abstention. With that, I will step back into my vice chair <laughs> shadows. Thank you. Welcome. 2001, mister. <laughs> you have to get the practice so you don't forget how to do it. <laughs> All right. Am I still chair after all? <laughs> yep. you me out? <laughs> okay, that brings us to item 15. Uh, oh, we have some very patient people in the room. <laughs> Request uh, for an on stream daytime, on -street daytime parking waiver. Uh, William Andrew Breckwald. Yeah, Will. Will. Breckwald. Will. Very, very. Yes, yeah, very good. That, that will do. Hi, I'm Alana Westwater. Hi, great. So we do have your application in front of us, but for the public record, introduce yourself and summarize your request, please. Great. Uh, sure. Uh, Will Breckwald. Uh, both of us moved in to 12 Brooks in August. So Arlington residents for just a few months. Um, yeah. Alana Westwater, um, uh, 12 Brooks as resident. And she owns the car. So. So, and, I, and car owner, <laughs> yes. I guess. So, yeah. And uh, I guess the situation is um, we are renters. Our landlord lives above us. We have tandem parking. And so, uh, and we have a two hour limit, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. So 
essentially we are kind of constantly shuffling cars so folks can go to work or the gym or wherever um, and just to dodge this two hour window or else we may get a ticket. Uh, and we've gotten a ticket for going five minutes over before, so it's, it's kind of a real threat. Um, and from what we've seen living there a few years, even though there's soccer games and things going on, there's not a lot of cars parked there. Uh, it's a pretty quiet end of Brooks Ave. It's not that close to the school. It's the far end from that. So um, it's not unreasonable to expect that there's going to be a parking spot. And it'd be nice to use it. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, I just, um, I think uh, with us working from home, it would be very helpful with, um, I don't have, we don't have a place to put the car when we move it out. Um, we don't like drive off premises. So the shuffling will happen and it's very commonplace to be in meetings for both of us from probably eight to 11, oh, 10, and then you get a ticket. Um, so it would be nice to have a little bit of flexibility and that's really what we're looking for out of this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will uh, see if there's anybody in the public on Zoom or in the room that wanted to uh, comment on this application before we turn to the board. So if you're in Zoom and you want to make any comments, uh, please raise your hand at this time. I'm not currently in the Zoom meeting, so I'll rely on Ms. Marr as always. No hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, and I will further note um, in researching this that uh, credit to the applicants for reading our parking policies very carefully <laughs> because we're not sure that we've ever uh, considered one of these, and I, I won't be ashamed to admit that I didn't even know about it. Um, so, um, so that's a compliment, <laughs> and I think <laughs> now we have to decide what to do. So um, I will now turn to the board for any questions, comments, motions. Mr. Hurd. Well, my first question, is this, is this you guys on Google Maps? We made it. Yes. Yeah, we made it. <laughs> we made it. I sent it oh, to my parents. Stand out there for that to happen. We, we, uh, we saw the, because work from home, so out the window we saw the Google car drive by. They turned around at the end of the block, and so we ran out just for a minute, and we got on Google Maps. Wow. Well, nice. Sent it to our parents immediately when yeah. we saw yeah. it. <laughs> yes. um, so I guess... I'm going to ask town council because I'm not, I also am not familiar with the, this particular area of art. Now, is the request essentially to create a space to, specifically for their vehicle or is it just to repeal two hour parking in front of their property? I would interpret it, Mr. Hurd, as for their vehicle. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think a couple of years ago I would have said, no to this application just because but we've been going through this whole you know kind of change and you know what, how we had thought of our parking policies you know the next item if you want to stick around talks about overnight parking um the you know the two-hour parking is in place there at the request of many residents because of commuter parking um i don't it sounds like that's not an issue where you are, um, I mean, I would be more comfortable, and I, I don't know if it's within the request or if there's a way to even carve this out in our traffic rules and order to just repeal the two-hour parking in front of the one particular resident, but I don't know if that's the, the right avenue for this. I think, you know, it's in, it's in the rules. So, I mean, if we're allowed to create a parking space for one individual, then great. I think, but I don't know, there's something about that that gives me a little bit of a pause where I think while you were, were the individuals that found the rule that was already in place, I think when, when others hear that they're going to say that they want, well, hey, that's the solution to the commuter parking is to just create a, sp a parking space in front of my particular house just from my car. Um, Again, I, I don't know if town council has any thoughts on whether or not, as an alternative, we can just repeal to our parking in front of this one particular house, or it, I mean that might be a a enforcement nightmare for police. It just I mean it does give me a little bit of pause to just designate one portion of the public way for one individual. Through the chair. Yeah. 
uh, uh, as always, yeah. Mr. Chair, <laughs> thank you. I, not a bad suggestion, Mr. Hurd. I think that for, in consistence with um, Ms. Mahan, Ms. Mahan's comments about procedure yeah. earlier on, I think it probably be best practice if the board was going to take such an action or consider such an action for it to do it at a future meeting uh, when that has been noticed more clearly. I think this individual application pertains to this individual and not necessarily the, the street itself. Okay. Mr. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, oh. Yeah, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I was going to congratulate you as well. I noticed that seeing you here tonight, I realized it was the two of you was <laughs> on the Google Maps. Um, I almost looked at this not so much as the spot in front of the house, and I realize Attorney Cunningham said that, but I, it seems to me that anywhere on Brooks, as long as that two hour, you don't necessarily have to be in front of your house, do you? I, I mean, um, so what was it? The, what so is it's the, in other words, there's a stretch of Brooks Ave there. I'm just concerned at some point people are going to start going back to Alewife to get into town, and that's going to become a problem in terms of parking there. So I would be reluctant to remove that restriction because I, yeah. I see that as an area that People are going to, the red line never becomes um, more reliable. You're going to see more people, more people going into town. So I, I see that potentially as a problem. You might find what, what's going to happen is it's going to be cars in front of your house before you even pull out of the driveway because that was the experience. That's what led that restriction to go in prior to the pandemic. And, and so just asking you if, if you had, a, you know, ideally you'd like to be in front of your house, but if it was a sticker, for, for daytime use, would you care if it was anywhere on the street? Yeah, I mean, we, we really weren't thinking of removing the two-hour parking in front of the house. The, the way it's written, I don't know exactly how to interpret it, but um, yeah, if it's a sticker and if we had to park a few houses down <clears throat> and they're okay, like it... Yeah, it may not be an issue now, but it, it, yeah. that would be my concern to do something yeah. tonight to remove that because I think we might be creating another problem. Yeah, I think we're really kind of focusing on like one vehicle. Yeah, yeah I think that's the that is the hope. <laughs> limited scope yeah. here. Well, I mean, I will. But I see, Mr. Mr. Dickens. Town Manager. I mean, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mr. Feeney. Thank you, Mr. Dickens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, to be clear, when we evaluated this request, it was uh, this would be interpreted as what we call a dash pass. So you would be getting an eight and a half, eleven piece of paper that lists your license plate and exempts you from two hour parking on Brooks Ave. So this would not be consideration of a physical parking spot located in a specific space on the street. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Attorney Gunning. And Mr. Chair, just to, just to back that up, and I think Mr. Hurd alluded to it earlier, I think that to do something otherwise and why my interpretation is what it is, is that it really creates an enforcement nightmare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's that factors into how I interpreted this particular uh, regulation. I don't want to jump in in front of other people. So I give new information. You know, we learn something new every time in these meetings. Yeah. You know, we try to be prepared, but it's hard with with everything that we have on our plates. Um, so as you know, I, I guess I, I had in my mind envisioned this like a reserved handicap space in front of somebody's house and if that's not the case then it is you know it, it's definitely more palatable for me mm -hmm. um because you know it essentially someone is parked in front of your house you can't go out and knock on the door and say hey get out of here I, this is my spot um it does create issues of you know other neighbors that might say, hey, this car has been parked in my house, in front of my house for eight hours. So I would, if we do approve this, I would recommend, you know, kind of spreading out the burden a little bit if you can't be in front of your house. Um, but I mean, we, we, I guess my suggestion with the two hour parking was just relative to an idea that we're putting it specifically in your house and kind of granting you a little piece of town property all to yourselves. So, I mean, with that, I would withdraw any requests to explore, you know, repealing to our parking just in one particular location. Yeah, I think from um, from the discussion, it's sounding like this, you know, referring to the, the, the parking policy that this sounds like an on-street daytime parking permit, uh, parenthesis permanent, you know, with a fee structure that's mentioned in, in the policy, and that does seem to apply just to one vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
to one, one owner. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? <clears throat> um, my process and all the P words that I like to talk about, but I, I definitely uh, stand by it. Um, to me, you'd have to demonstrate a hardship, and when you say your hardship is, you know, having to shuffle in and out of the driveway, to me that's not a hardship. That's mm -hmm. an inconvenience. Um, and what you have to understand is your neighbors came before the board um, and said, because of the commuter parking, please put this two hour in effect. Mm -hmm. um, and we understand the sacrifice of that, including having people come over to visit um, if it's more than two hours. But because of the situation there, they asked that, and I know there are other streets. I'm thinking of precedent, what would happen here if we approve this, which I'm not inclined to do, honestly. Um, if, if the request was, you know, it's a temporary thing, and, you know, say I had a medical issue and I have a caregiver coming for two weeks, two months, whatever, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the shuffle and not wanting to do that and being out on the street, um, I know there are other streets and I've spoken to neighbors on Lafayette and Boulevard because I go nuts in the morning. Go down there by 6.30 in the morning, completely packed with commuter parking. And, and people like, I can't even get out of my driveway. We've had to have police come down and try to, and you can't find the owners because they're on the alwife. So, um, but they haven't taken the step to put up the two hour parking because they don't want to give up the rare opportunity that they can park on their street. Um, so um, I think f f for this particular request, I would not be in favor of it. I would not support it because um, you do have an option. You can shuffle your cars around. I know it's a pain. You can come by my house, 23 Howard Street. I have two adult disabled people who live there, mm -hmm. and I do the shuffle, and I have a hill like this, which really stinks in the wintertime because you've got to sand and, plow and <coughs> shovel. Otherwise, you go into the backyard on Higgins Street. So I, I totally get that. But we have to be mindful of what we, we do here. I mean, maybe if you go out and canvass your neighbors and say, will you support us to repeal the request of Brooks Ave, um, Paolo Marinelli and others, which I don't think they'll be in favor of, to say to get rid of two-hour parking so that we can do that, but to have this one individual so that you don't have to do the shuffle out of your driveway, I think, it, I think it's a really, it's a precedent that I'm, I'm very leery of, um, so I, I, I'll wait to see what the rest of the board does, but I wouldn't support it, and I can only imagine what it would open. Mr. Hurt? Uh, I guess it would be for Attorney Cunningham. If we grant this, what's the, is it in perpetuity? We're granting it forever? Is it something that has to be renewed? Is it something that we can take back if we don't want to? Uh, renewable yearly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Renewed annually, Mr. Hurd, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I hear all that, and I think that's a consideration that we've had. I think that's a consideration we had with overnight parking, and there wasn't a whole lot of, I mean, we had the pilot, and there was, I think, a lot fewer people that requested overnight parking permits. And I think in the past we've not, granted or not, we, particularly we talk a lot about when I'm parking. Clearly this is a, yeah. a, a new issue that we've dealt with, the daytime parking, but you know, I think we granted it. Uh, we were hesitant because we thought it would create this influx of people parking overnight and it hasn't. Um, so I guess my me mentality is kind of getting going towards not saying no to something because of what could you know, relative to parking, you know, to say, oh, you know, all these people could come out of the woodwork and ask for the same thing. I think, I mean, would it be within our discretion if all of a sudden, you know, 400 people in East Arlington said, I want to do the, get one of these passes too, that to start denying passes and then just say, you know, when they come up for a renewal, say, you know, you know we kind of open a can, can of worms and we're not going to renew any of them that we have out there. And then we're going to go to town meeting and ask to amend our zoning bylaws to take out this. Like, do we have wide discretion, I guess, in this area? Or is it something that if we, if we approve one, we have to approve a similar application? Mr. Chair. Attorney 
I think, Mr. Hurd, you would have that discretion. The board would have that discretion. And I think that the applications would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis anyway, pursuant to the, the hardship evaluation that Mrs. Mahan talked about. The, traditionally, that's, that's the type of analysis I've seen the board undertake on these types of applications. So there could be applications that the board might deem uh, more or less of a hardship than others. But to the extent that there was a wave of applications that it created a problem and the, the board wanted to reconsider its position at that point and uh, begin denying those applications and then not renewing applications as they came up at the end of a year, that would be within the board's discretion. Okay. Um, let me ask a couple questions that I'll turn to my, to my colleagues. Uh, to the town manager, if you are aware, um, can you give us an idea of how many of these two-hour parking streets there are? Like I'm thinking about it, it, potential expansion you know, of, I wouldn't say a precedent because this is already in our parking policies, but if we had more people aware of this, uh, what would what we be looking at? That, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize, but I do not have that information immediately well, that, available. This is why in a town meeting the moderator always says, transmit your questions ahead of time and don't try to spring them on town officials. So there's your, <laughs> your lesson for that. Um, so I think that's something for us to generally keep in mind. Um, I guess that was my only other question. I have some comments, but I will reserve those to after my colleagues are finished. Yeah. Uh, Mr. I, think, I think that list is available in our parking policies. I mean, yes. at, at the end of it, I mean, there's a, a list of streets and it tells you I mean, oh. what the restrictions are. Oh, mean, great. So, Thank so you. I mean, might be able to scan that quickly and get a sense. Um, I was aware of this, you know, and so, so, because I kind of like rewrote, you know, the, 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 the parking policy part, you know, uh, when we were planning to do or considering doing the overnight parking pilot because I wanted the new I wanted to put that in as our policy so that people had a sense and I saw it and was like wow that's a whole nother discussion you know and and perhaps the you know, um we'll get some insights as to how we want whether we want to change policy and how if we do how we do it I mean, based on the overnight parking trial you know and so so a, one of the things I don't like about the discretionary element of it is that it is discretionary, you know, uh, and, and so uh, I, I realize that gives us me the ability to choose and make me hopefully good decisions and hopefully consistent ones, I mean, but I think, I mean, a policy that kind of I mean, does that work for us is better, I mean, and I'd like to see us develop that policy if we want to go down that road you know, um, and then and then apply it I mean, so I can see us setting up potentially for uh, another trial I mean that, that what made the overnight parking trial easier was that I mean, we had a place for people to go I mean, when they need to get their cars off the road that option isn't there in daytime because I mean the lots that we use for I mean, storing cars at nighttime are being used in the daytime I mean, so We'd have to come up with a, a, a potentially another solution if we, you know, I'll say like, okay, you need to get your car off the road. There's a snow emergency and it's, it's in the daytime, you know. And so, I would like to see us work through I mean, a new policy, you know. Uh, and 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 so, I mean, if this were the more of a health issue, I mean, you know, and, and had an elevated sense of urgency and need. And I would be supportive of it. I certainly understand, I mean, the issues with um, work I mean, and, and, and the conflict when you have two people on a call at the time as you work related and you need to, to move things. I, I certainly get that, you know, uh, but he, he, it's, it's not unique, I'm sure, you know, uh, and um, it's just, there's a level of discomfort with granting this me that I just can't get over now um, to get to a yes on it. So that's where I am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Corson. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Um, yeah, I, 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 I am comfortable with it and I'll, I'll say why. I, um, I view this as a special situation because of where you live being close to ill life. One, two, both applicants here work at home. And that to me is the condition for us granting you the permit. So if your job situation changed or, or something like that, that may come up at renewal time. But that to me is the precedent. The other thing, when I look at our parking policies, we have hardship 
uh, in the overnight parking section, this section doesn't mention hardship. It just mentions that someone can come in. So I view that, again, I didn't create the policy, but I follow, try to follow the policy. That, to me, gives us discretion in terms of the, the special circumstance. So I think proximity to ill life, and, and it is part of a, a larger problem that we may be looking at in terms of what type of enforcement we have. But I think you're in a unique situation, and other parts of town, you wouldn't have that worry. You could just park all day, but because of where you are and because of the issues there, I think it makes sense that the two hour, but because you find yourself in jobs that, that are at home, I, I personally am comfortable based on our on the language of our policy uh, and approving this. So on, on that basis, I'm going to move approval. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll make a few remarks as well. I would also su I'll also support that motion. Um, if nobody else seconds it, I'll second it out of uh, yeah, second, Mr. Hurd. Um, you know, I think that I also feel that I, I'm mindful of of the newness of this and you know it's a, the, some of the risks that come with with new. Um, but I think the policy is there. I think Mr. Corsi makes a really fair point that you know that it doesn't mention hardship, and and um, I think the the re residents did their homework and you know and, and made a case for why that might be a fair thing to do. I'm also mindful that the purpose of the two-hour parking in that location is to prevent commuter parking at Alewife, and by definition, this would you know this is not not a concern that wouldn't that wouldn't um, dilute or weaken that in any way. Um, if we do get other requests, I think we would need to, uh, su subject to the discretion, but err on the side of being understanding of those. And I think, you know, what would happen would be there may or may not be room on the street, you know, if, if they were to fill up with other daytime permits. And I'm not necessarily encouraging that. I think the board should retain some discretion about, uh, if we were to vote to do this, um, about about doing that. But I'm just kind of pointing out in my, in my thinking that I think it's a reasonable, um, you know, there's some reasonable parameters that, that would allow us to do this if, the, if we, uh, if we have board to do that. So I think we do have a um, motion by Mr. DeCourcy and Mr. Hurd. And I'll second the motion. Um, again, similar to what Mr. DeCourcy and Ms. Hellman said is, I mean, the language is pretty clear. Uh, and, um, you know, we've had, we have a lot of experience with overnight parking permits. In six years, this is the first one of these that's come up. And I think you, you know, what well, if you get the re request approved, just know that if all of a sudden 2,000 of your friends and neighbors find out about this and they ask for it as well, it could next year it might not happen. Um, but for now, we have relief that's in our traffic policies, and I don't see a reason to not grant what's laid out before us. Okay. Any further discussion? Well, I, I would just, maybe this is out of scope for now, but I, I would like us to kind of maybe review the policy you know, at, at some point you know, soon, you know, and, and then, um, yeah, and maybe keep it, I mean, change it or whatever, you know, so, because we, um, it, it maybe also look at the other streets, I mean, that have, uh, these time limits and see, you know, if, if let's say we folks aren't working, I mean, from home, I mean, but they're in, I mean, a dense building, lots of cars, I mean, and they want to avail themselves of this, I mean, will we say yes or no? I mean, because right now, if the threshold is that you're working, well, let's be, maybe they're unemployed or, or whatever, you know, and, and now, you know, they, they have two cars and they don't want the hardship of having to shuffle around, you know. We just, I think we need some way that we are applying this consistently so that it's not looking like we are biased in some way that is um, less palatable, you know. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. I think for me, it's um, thinking back to, I mean, if it's not posted otherwise, you can park on the street during the day in Arlington. You know, that, that you, that's the default condition. Um, and I think from, if I were looking at a future permit, I would look at the intent of the, what's the reason behind that two-hour um, prohibition. You know, so, so I mean, anyway, um, I think it's, it's a worthwhile discussion, and I think it is good that we were careful with it. But I think we're ready for a vote. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Feeney. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would just add that I completed reviewing your parking uh, policies and can give you a listing of roads that have 
some semblance of a two-hour parking restriction on Very it. impressive. I would not deny you that opportunity. <laughs> there, you also have a number of one-hour parking restrictions, which I did not I hadn't include. even imagined. Uh, but there are portions of, and there, this is all segmented by like, you know, points 170 feet northerly or southerly, but roads that do contain at least some portion under a two-hour parking restriction would be Bailey Road, Broadway, Brooks, Davis Road, Fairmont, sections of Mass Ave, Milton, sections of Park Ave, Rawson, Russell Street, Russell Terrace, Thorndike, and Varnum. So there are a number of East Arlington streets very, there. Very impressive. I, I promise we were not vamping in order to give the town manager time to do that, but it worked out. <laughs> but he appreciates it nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, glad to help. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, say Mrs. Mahan. I can see count to three. Yes. Um, so uh, this is something I will support, but I will tell you that I do anticipate lots of people coming in, and I will vote for each and every one of those. And I think anyone who doesn't do that is doing a disservice because to me, I want to be able to park when all my neighbors have asked for two hour parking before a commuter. And maybe, as Mr. Diggins says, we start to address that issue because it's inconvenient to move cars out of the driveway. Does it make sense? But I can count to three and I'll go to that, but I'm going to, as a neighborhood activist, let everybody know down there, this is an option that's available to them and, and they should go for it and we should vote for each and every one of them that come in. Duly noted. Mr. Hurd, did you I have something else to I don't want to belabor this and keep you here until, <laughs> our meeting has to end by 11. I would just know <laughs> just globally, the two uh, parking restrictions there because to prevent commuters. So it's not there because it doesn't want people to be able to park out in front of the house just like I can do in front of my house. So it, it almost, you know, it, I guess if everyone in that neighborhood comes out and is granted one of these permits, it, it's like two problems. You know, you're able to sol still solve the commuter pro parking problem that was the original reason that you had the two-hour parking and allow people to park in front of their house just like people are in other parts of town. So I, I guess as Mrs. Mahan said that, it, it actually makes me even feel even better about this request. Yeah. Even if in the instance more people come out and ask for, for permits under this section. Okay. Any That's it. I'm done. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> Any other discussion? We have another hour and a half, so. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm resisting. So, I mean, I said my piece about the policy review, and so I'm going to stick with that. That's it. Thanks. Admirable straight. All right. So, on a motion to approve by Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mr. Hurd, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. So, it is a four to one vote. And who said you can't make a difference in local government? <laughs> Hey, I worked, I worked, I feel like I've seen you at the State House. I worked at the State House for four years. Oh, you probably, yes, <laughs> but we have. Yeah. Awesome. All right, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, we have uh, item 16, discussion and potential vote on the overnight parking pilot program. Um, and uh, I will note that there is some public correspondence that we've had from members of the public regarding uh, the potential extension of this that is in the agenda items and is on uh, Select Board's Agendas and Minutes page online for the public. Um, so I will now turn this over to my colleague, the dear Mr. Dickens. And because the world runs, or the universe runs on irony, you know, <laughs> this would come up It next. certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, I'm sure you're gonna know how I'm gonna uh, go on this, me, but you, I hope you have the, the, the data in front of you, Reed. and so uh, when the last time I presented this data, we had 60 you know, uh, uh, people who had availed themselves of you know, the trial, I mean, and it went up to 70, you know, just, just a data point that really means nothing other than to say that we have 70 people that have, um, are part of the trial. I mean, uh, uh, County um, East Arlington is precinct one through seven, you know, and the rest of, of Arlington is 8 to 21. We have 38 in East Arlington and 32 in the rest of Arlington, which amounts to 54 percent, you know, in the east and 46 percent elsewhere. You know, this is 
fairly even um, split, you know. Uh, and and uh, so I asked the, the chief you know, to give me data that she thought would be helpful in helping us assess the impact of, of this. You know, I asked her that, or I said, tell me what data you have, and then I will make the request. I was hoping I'd get the latter, you know, but, but I got the former. You know what I mean? So, for, so for, for her, that was the, the, the number of tickets that have been issued and the complaint number. Now, these numbers I mean, are, are town-wide, you know, and she says the complaint number, uh, you really have to take it with a grain of salt because, you know, there's, they aren't entered consistently, you know, and, and so, so um, and I think anecdotally, I mean, for us getting emails, I got only one I mean, that was against it before, uh, well, during, during the trial, and that was really based on I me, mean, someone who uh, had, a, who lived on Mass Ave and was apparently parking on uh, another street. I mean, I, I imagine that's because you can't park on, on Mass Ave, I mean, uh, and, and also, I, we, I think one of the things that we did uh, which I think is a set source of tension for me is that we told people that they need to park me like in front of their place or as close to um, their place as possible, which I think creates this sense of me that space in front of my house is mine. And it's like, well, it's not, you know, and, and but, but nonetheless, I understand why we did that. And, and I would say if we uh, will, if we review things me um, later in a positive light, we might want to take that into consideration. And so um, I have talked with the town manager, I've talked with Mr. DeCourcy, and I've talked with the chief, mean, and, and chief especially uh, has said that she would be fine if we froze the number of participants and, um, and then carried this through um, the spring as uh, another trial to see me how this works, you know, during winter, because we need to see how people behave um, when we tell them that they need to get off the street I mean, during a snow emergency, I mean, and that would give us a chance to come up with maybe a secondary warning system. Because right now we send town-wide email uh, to folks letting them know they have to get off the street, but uh, the manager said he thinks it would be not burdensome I mean, to uh, create a, another layer of, of warning to people, I mean, to let them know that they really do need to get their cars off the street and that they have a space, I mean, that their sticker that they bought gave, gave them a space, I mean, and a lot. So, so, so I feel that freezing this would be in the spirit, I mean, of what we told people in regarding the pilot and that we're not going to continue the trial and allow more people in. We're just going to now take the 70 that we have and, and base another trial off of that to see how the system works uh, in the wintertime because I think that's what people are most concerned about. Ian. And so if we were to do that, I mean, and I'm thankful that you put a potential vote on because I told you I didn't want people to feel they need to make a decision now about whether we do this additional trial later on uh, is that we'd have to determine how long it would last, whether it was through March, April, or, or longer. You know? But what I would like, uh, if we needed to vote on it, it, is that we would say no more people need in the trial now because we don't want a rush you know, into the trial, given that this would be potentially new information that we're going to allow people who, are, who have already signed up me to They'll have to pay me you know, more, me, but to continue through the winter as another trial. That's it. Thanks. So just to clarify, are you suggesting that we would freeze it at the number of current permit holders or at the number of potential spaces, sp slots for permits that we created originally? Good question. No, the number of current permit holders. Gotcha. Yeah. Mr. Hurd. Well, I will say, in full disclosure, there's now 71. 72. 72. Oh, wow. Well. As of today, and there's one sole permit holder in Precinct 18. Um, you know, I, I actually, I think I, I'd be supportive of, of it, letting it continue. And I'm almost hesitant to cap it. And the reason, when I look at these complaints, these complaints aren't about the 70 cars. Because in a given night, if there's 70 people that have permits, there's 500 cars 
parked throughout Arlington. If you drive around, there's a lot of areas in Arlington that just don't get ticketed, and I, it seems almost inequitable, especially since now I'm in that group of beneficiaries of this, that, I mean, when we put these permits out, we didn't get a rush, and I don't think there's any evidence that if we continue it, that there's gonna be a rush for additional applicants. I think everyone, when it snows, we all know. We get pinged and we have to get, not just overnight, we have to get up for a snow emergency, we have to get our cars off during the day too. You have to get your cars off the street <laughs> if there's a snow emergency. So I, I mean, I think just in general, there is sufficient notice. I mean, I don't wanna go against the recommendation of the chief and what the, you know, what the overwhelming, what the board thinks. I just, I, my inclination was just to kind of let it roll um, because I don't anticipate that whether we open up the number of applications or keep, keep cap it at 71, that there's gonna be an influx of requests. But I mean, I think what I've learned from the, from the pilot program is that there's not an overwhelming desire for people to go out and get the, the permits. And, and I don't say that as a, as a negative towards the program. I think it shows us that in the past where people, you know, we've thought that, you know, if we open this up beyond when we used to only grant overnight parking permits in very limited situations, that we, our streets would be flooded with permitted overnight parking vehicles. I, I just don't think that that's what we've seen since the inception of this pilot program. Um, and like I said, you know, up in my neighborhood, people park on the street all the time, every street, all around. And clearly, given that on this list, Precinct 18 has zero permits, they're parking without permits. And periodically you'll get ticketed and then, you know, the cars will come off and they go back out. So. I guess, I mean, the, the sum of what I'm saying is that the people that are participating in the program are, aren't nearly all the, the streets, all, all the cars that are parked overnight on our streets and certainly don't account for the complaints that we see listed there. Mr. DeGorsen. Th thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Diggins had mentioned, he and I had had some discussions about I, um, bring something to the board, um, extending the program. And I can, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Diggins, in terms of take the number that are in place right now in December, but we did um, approve 125 permits. So I, I'm just as comfortable saying up to 125 permits that gets extended over the next several months because I, I don't think we're going to have much more activity. We did set that as an upper limit um, back in over the summer. Um, so I could, I, I, right now I, I might even be leaning towards going up to the 125, but I, I, I do think it makes sense to continue through the winter. The feedback I've received has been overwhelmingly positive um, with one or two exceptions. Um, and, and I think we did set that number. I know we set it for summer type, fall type use uh, overnight, but um, I think Mr. Hurd makes a good point, and and um, we've had a few people added recently. And, and as long as that spot is tied to a spot in the municipal lot, which the 125 allows us, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. So I don't know if you feel like the difference between 70 and 125 becomes problematic. Yes, well, well, I I feel that I need to circle back, I mean, to the town manager, but especially I mean the the chief, I mean to see how. Uh, she feels about it, you know. I, I will say, look, I'm, I'm happy to lose this argument, but I need to defend it, you know. Uh, uh, and that is, a, I, I don't know to what extent we, we have a good extent of the demand because I feel, and I have just some anecdotal evidence me that a, uh, people didn't avail themselves of this because it was limited me, and they me, just didn't want to, in one case, I mean, I know the person felt that they, they were paying for someone else, I mean, 
paying someone else, like a neighbor or something for a spot and, or something that they would lose it if they took this and they weren't sure that they'd be able to get it back. I don't know how many people in that, in that, that case. But, but I mean, it would be an experiment, right? If we, if we, we said at this meeting, you know, that you, you have until uh, up, or well, you can, you know, you can sign up. I mean, we have the cap at, at 125, I mean, and that's our experiment, you know, 125, and then we see how this goes, and then if it goes well, we can open it up to a higher number, up to the, up to the limit of people, up to the limit of slots that we have in our, um, in, in our, Various lots, you know. So, so, um, so as I said, I'm happy to lose the argument, but I feel that I really do need to check back, you know, with town, the town manager and um, chief. Yeah, I just would say I almost interpreted your comments in favor of what I, and I say that because. You mentioned that we don't have have a sense of the demand. Well, if we cap it, we're not going to have a sense of the demand either, and we're not getting any additional data. If we leave additional, say, I'm comfortable leaving it at the 125, that, and if all of a sudden we have 50 new applicants, then we'll know that there's more demand. But if we tell people that there's no more applicant, that there's no more permits available, then we're not going to know whether or not somebody would come come out. So I think just from a perspective of knowing what the demand is and trying to see if post pilot, you know, the words out and more people are going to to go avail themselves of the permits. I think we need to have some, I think the 125 is the correct number because now we'll know if more people come out next week and say, you know, we, we want the, the overnight parking. And if it's 200 people, it's going to be the first, you know, 50 people to come out to get them, and then well, we can assess the data in the spring from there if we want to expand it or contract it or get rid of it. Yeah, I, 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 just, to, Mr. Diggins, to me, the win is extending the program, that the scope, whether it's 70 or 125, getting it through the winter, that's the win. Yeah. Um, so and and so I I you wanted to ask you about you know feeling comfortable about seventy one twenty five but when we first started talking about this we talked about we want data we want to learn more and and I think Mr Hurd makes a good point that if if we do have that additional capacity that we can offer and it, it is a number that we selected previously perhaps that gives us more information so I I, I still stand where I am but I. I, when you said lose the argument, you won the argument. I, I, I feel like you've done a great job with this in extending the program. That's a win. Yeah. Well, I meant is lose this argument. Yeah. I mean, on the scope. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. So, so. By I just, I just have to defend it just for the integrity, my sense of integrity. <laughs> so, so, so. I since since part of the uh, scope suggestion came from my report of the police chief, I wonder if the town manager. Any knowledge of that, that's fine, but did you have any thoughts about uh, or advice to us about the scope uh, if we extend this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, though I didn't speak with the chief uh, directly about this, given that Mr. Diggins had engaged the chief in a conversation, I do not believe there would be a significantly meaningful difference between 75 and 125, especially given that 125 at this point is uh, sort of a theoretical figure. We don't know what our actual... Uh, figure would be my, uh, you know, chief concern was just finding a way to make it a requirement that these permit holders uh, enroll in Arlington Alerts so that there could be no such excuse that folks did not know, but it requires folks to opt in with their cell phone numbers so that we could call, text, email, and let folks know that uh, now is the time to get your vehicles off the road in hopes of making making it so there were no issues during the winter. And I think if I could ask a question while I have the opportunity, sure. is just understanding exactly what date we would be extending. Uh, That's know, what we're I think we're through December 31st now, yeah. but just to know yeah. uh, what that date would be. Yeah, that would. That's a, I think a note to my colleagues. If someone were to make a motion, we would need to discuss that and, and you know figure that out. Yeah. So, the question of how, how much further, how much longer? Yeah. You know, well, I would say, me, a minimum of 
April 30th just because I was here in 1997. And I remember April 1st. <laughs> so so it would be easy to say like three months in March 31st, but that doesn't get us through April 1st. You know? <laughs> so so that's why I say April 30th. You know? uh, but then we're in the throes of town meeting. Yeah. You know? and, and so so then do we go, I mean, for me, it's, it's either three, four, or six months. Five is just a little odd. I mean, we did five for the pilot for the pilot trial because it just took us a while to get to yes, you know. But, but um, so, um, so either. I, I, I mean, my thought about this is is um, I'm I'm happy to do this. And, and speaking of irony, I was one of the I think most reluctant to to go for this, um, and I'm glad it's gone well. Um, I would like to make sure that we. I mean, to me, we should extend this long enough to get a good experience, but also to give ourselves some time and space to really evaluate this. And I think for me that includes soliciting a resident feedback. You know, that if we do this for a significant period of time, and then we go back to the neighborhoods and say, how did this go? Because right now we're relying on anecdotal complaints, and there's value in that, but they may not be the complete story. Um, I would also suggest that, that we give us some time to do some more rigorous data analysis that um, Ideally, some cross tabbing, cross tabulations of the complaints with the density and the locations of the permits. I mean, that would be a GIS exercise, but that's certainly potentially theoretically possible. More work, you know, do not have time to do that here. But you know, if we if we allow, if we give it enough time, you know, maybe kick this past town meeting, where we're going to be too busy to really, you know, to really evaluate this, um, then we could do ask for resident input, we could do more serious data analysis, we could see what it's like through the entire season. Yeah. So I'm kind of in for a penny, in for a pound, I guess. In that and that sets us up for six months then, gets us locked in with the fiscal year, you know, we get out of town meeting, you know, sometime in May, you know, so. So that would go through June 30? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Uh, I think we need a motion. I'll make. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I see. I don't know if Ms. Meyer or Mr. Oh, Pini oh, sorry. Some, yes, yes. We're just looking for clarity. Thank you, Mr. Course, Chair. Of course, yeah. Before we go, so it, the the date is helpful. Would the same fee structure apply? Just so we know, oh, yeah. sort of uh, applying this moving forward. Yeah, yeah dollar so, day. Okay. Yeah. Dollar the dollar a day approach. Yeah. Thank you. Has a nice ring to it. You know. Dollar a night. It's <laughs> yeah. a night. Well, yeah. Sure. 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 You just gave them that. You yeah. can't charge them a dollar a day. <laughs> Okay, so who's going to put this together in a motion? Well, I will make a motion that we extend the trial made uh, uh, through this through June thirtieth of next year, the same um, rate pricing, and, and uh, that um, yeah, it's because it, yeah, and the, the limit is one twenty five in um, slots. Second. Okay. So it's June thirtieth, twenty twenty four. What did I say? Mr. Pooler's 2020. <laughs> yeah. we, we've learned to be very careful about the dates these days. That's okay. great. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I had to jump that. <laughs> and that was a second from, from Mr. DeCourcy here. Um, any further discussion from the board? On a motion from Mr. Diggins uh, and a seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed is unanimous. Thank you for your work, Mr. Diggins. A pleasure, really. Okay, now we go to uh, future select board meetings and a couple of other things. So we currently only have a meeting for December 18th. Now, on the, regarding the time of that, though, we need to do 6 o'clock on the 18th. Unless um, the board thinks that it's going to be a longer meeting. Yeah. Maybe set it earlier. So the, the intent of that is to have a pretty much a consent agenda kind of very quick meeting it's for that day. For the purposes of license renewals. Yeah. I'm fine with that. All right. And then, um, so we need to start, and we don't have any meetings scheduled in January, so um, we should pick right up. Obviously, New Year's is January the 1st. Monday is January the 1st. Um, do we want to go that first week and go on the Wednesday, or just wait till the 8th? We should go to that Wednesday. I think for the office sake, we need that first week. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or no? No. Neither. Okay. It's up to the boards. You guys decide then. Yeah, I'll, oh, yeah, I'll probably we, we do appreciate advice. <laughs> That's right. but, um, I'm gonna the 8th would be fine for yeah, us yeah. if that. I was about to say, I'm going to be probably out of town on the 2nd into the 3rd. You know, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is a good yeah. So, is the 8th center okay? Yeah. All right. I prefer Mondays, but I can. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I do too. I can mark, uh, work around it. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so we have the 8th, um, and then uh, how about the 22nd? Yes. That's good, because we have MLK Day on the 15th, so that works out pretty well. Okay. Um, and then two weeks after that would be February the 5th. And then now two weeks after that is, is a holiday. That's uh, the right. President's Day. So we'd have to figure out. How does 21 look? 21 is fine for me. No. Yeah. It's the day of the hour. Okay. All right, so we'll do the 20, 21st then, and that takes us through February. Do you want to do March? Yes, do March. Please. All right, and so then March. Every Monday should be put aside because we might need it, but you'll probably ask, oh, ask for that. Oh, because we'll be in Warren articles, yeah. You just don't know. I mean, so say, what we, regardless start of. With two and let's start with two. Let's start with two. Regardless of what we choose, we, I'll just put it aside every Monday. Set it so aside that and then we just fill agendas. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's true. Yeah. Let, I, I, I like that. I like Mr. Hurd's thinking here. All right, so I'm sorry. The latest one in February was the 20. First. 21st. Yeah. All right, so how about March 4th and the 18th? Sounds good. Okay. And I'll just be guys, here by, by myself on other days. That's right. Do you all <laughs> want to just, I mean. We have to do the April 1st. Oh, we have to do April 1st, yeah. I mean, April We have to because that's. Um, the first. I have it written down as yeah. that, so yeah. at least yeah. the 8th. May as well. But, you know, we're going to have to do, uh, we have to do April the 8th because that's the okay. right after the town election. So. Yep, it's the first Monday. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, boy. I'm coming up quick. All right. Okay. We good on those? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, so now we have uh, items 18, new business, correspondence received, crosswalk cross cross request on Broadway near the MBTA bus stop. Any motions or discussion? So I will make a motion. Yes, to please. Oh, to send the bus stop to the town manager, and I will just let the town manager know that we have dealt with that issue and, um, in the last three or four years, so there's probably some history of it, you know, um, and I can maybe get that to you, but just it's not new, you know. So I said. Second. All right, any discussion? Further discussion? So we have a motion to refer to the town manager by Mr. Diggins, a second by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Is unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, new business. Except in cases of emergency, the board will neither deliberate nor act upon topics presented in new business. Ms. Marr. No new business, thank you. Attorney Cunningham. No new business, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Feeney. Nothing to report, thank you. Ms. Mahan. I've had my fun, no new business. <laughs> Mr. Hurd. No new business. Mr. DeCourcy. Sorry, I'm breaking the streak. Oh. Very briefly. Oh. Very briefly. It's a good thing we're not playing. We seem, play. I'm not going to have another opportunity to, seem to do this. I, I, and I have to do it because of timing. So it's, it's, I have the latest double poll figures. And we oh. had 80 on May 1. We're now down to 58. Um, in November of 2020, there were 149 in town. So we're down to 58. I do still have some questions on the completeness of the list. And, um, I talked to Mr. Feeney several months ago and I'll follow up with him again to perhaps schedule a meeting with Verizon. But if this, this certainly is a, is, is, a, is a very positive trend. I will note I did receive word from Mr. Schlickman about a poll, double poll on Chestnut Street that he says is a doozy. So we'll be sure to uh, follow up on that. But down to 58. So that's, I, that's progress. Good I job. Would, I would congratulate you if that did not constitute deliberation. But <laughs> I think it doesn't, then my in the judgment of the chair. <laughs> Mr. Diggins. No, I have no new business. Uh, and I do not have any new business. That concludes our regular business. Uh, we now are going to move to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation against Eltron Incorporated. Um, and I'd uh, solicit a motion and suggest perhaps that that motion include uh, the provision to adjourn this meeting at the end of the executive session. Um, Traditional okay. nominator. I'd like to uh, move that we go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation. Uh, such a discussion in public would be detrimental um, to the select board in the town, and that when we adjourn out of executive session, we will come out into public se session to ad also adjourn. I can't talk. Does that work? 
It does. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Speaker. I need a second for that. A second. Okay. And it's a roll call vote for this, right? Yes. All right. So on a motion to move to executive session and then to adjourn there too, um, by Mrs. Mahana, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Mr. Uh, Attorney Cunningham, if you would call the roll. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. 5-0, unanimous. Next. We are in executive session.